Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm here with my dear respected brother, Abdullah al-Andalusi, uh, which I'm sure many of you know. He needs no introduction, but he is one of the most prolific debaters online and in fact everywhere, Muslim debaters. And mashallah, we've benefited from his work over the years. Uh, he's the founder of Muslim Debate Initiative. And he has been very active debating Zionists, debating atheists, debating feminists, debating liberal reformists. So mashallah, he has a very uh, storied track record, mashallah. And we're going to talk about his experience. We're going to talk about, you know, his insights into debate and other issues, inshallah. So welcome, Brother Abdullah. We're so happy to have you. Walaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you for having me. I know that you uh, uh, like to avoid uh, controversy, so I do appreciate you having me on uh, your show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we uh, really happy to have you, mashallah. So um, we have a lot of questions to get into, and we are also going to be looking at the chat. So if you have a question for uh, Brother Abdullah, you can post it in the chat we'll hopefully catch that and then we'll also uh, be checking super chats so the way to send a super chat is to go to muslimskeptic.com in the contribution or donate tab and just put a message that you want us to read put in the super chat and we'll check that as well and we'll read those inshallah okay so let's get started i guess we can start with something um you know i guess more conceptual, but you have a lot of people that are criticizing the concept of debate. You have Muslims that are saying debate is useless, it's a waste of time, no one is convinced by debate. Um, so what is your perspective on that? Well, uh, I think that it's people who say that might not understand what debate is trying to achieve. Um, if you think that debate is about uh, egos and looking good and just winning arguments like it's a, it's a wrestling match or a fighting match uh, that would say more about the person's own mentality projecting onto um, the activity of debate rather than debate itself uh, debate is an educational tool always has been um, the purpose of it is not to convince the other person you're debating it's actually to educate the audience and the best education is to see ikhtilaf is to see difference of opinion and differences clashing uh, because People hold uh, hidden assumptions. Everyone holds hidden assumptions uh, that they uh, hidden presuppositions, and it's good to have those exposed by debating someone who doesn't have those same presuppositions or assumptions. And so, in trying to convince um, the audience rather than each other, so if you're trying to convince somebody, they could say, "I don't, I don't believe you. I'm, I'm not convinced," and you know that's the end of that. But if you're trying to convince the audience and uh, this unknown amorphous blob of people who you don't know what they believe exactly, um, you might just have an inkling of what they believe, then you're, you're going to argue very much like a lawyer would um, in trying to argue by weight of evidence and making hopefully um, cogent argument uh, to persuade the audience that the inferences that you're making from the evidence is the strongest inferences there are. So it is. It's, it always has been an educational tool. Sometimes people, when they do debates, uh, especially like people imagine Islamic scholars debating each other, uh, but that's in a different realm. That's more like a, a, a discussion of this of disagreement so that one of them uh, could attain, be corrected, or, or they both correct, correct each other in different things, um, and they both reach the truth. So that's a different area of debate. Um, and that's what so this is what debate's always really been about. It's been the pursuit of truth and, and nothing else. Uh, so that's why I would say that uh, you're, uh, anyone who's against debate, uh, they're eliminating a key educational tool because they might be too um, shallow to understand the utility of debate. They just simply think it's a it's a UFC match between two fighters. Uh, but that isn't, that's never been the case, or it should never be the case, to, to be more precise. What about the perspective that, um, just as a follow-up question, what about the perspective that, well, you are giving a platform to the opposite side by debating that person. So when you debate an atheist, you're giving an atheist a platform to spout off on his atheism. So he's equally educating the audience um, along with you, yourself. Uh, or a feminist or a re liberal reformer Zindiq. So what is what is your thoughts on that or response to it? 
Well, um, when when truth meets falsehood, falsehood dashes out its brains. Uh, so it's, it's falsehood is, it has its brains dashed out by the truth coming and overcoming it. Um, that this is what the, the the teachings of the Quran tells us to be confident about the truth. Why should we be scared? It is those on falsehood uh, who should be scared to face the truth. And so, uh, in debate, there's nothing for us uh, to fear. And of course, you have to understand um, this is not the manhaj of the Prophet Muhammad uh, or the, the the Quran itself. The Quran mentions a lot of blasphemous ideas, right? In there is blasphemous ideas mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for to warn us away from them. So uh, could you be saying Allah's giving a platform to cover, <laughs> right? Well, uh, to inoculate us, uh, to warn us and to highlight its falsehood uh, within it by either reduction of absurdum arguments, um, uh, 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 refuting it, saying, uh, pointing that it doesn't have any evidence behind it. They speak with, uh, about God uh, without any authority, um, that they speculate, they're based on done, they have only... Um, uh, they have no certainty. So the Quran, it, the Quran platforms uh, kufr arguments in order to refute them. And likewise, an atheist um, giving them a platform is only so much that we is for the purposes of actually dissecting and, and destroying their ideas publicly, so that Muslims can see this, and of course atheists can see this. Now there will be diehard people on both sides of the audience uh, who will never change whatever you you could come in and say there is only one god and they'll be like yes you've won you've won and the other side will say there is no god and their side will be yes you oh that was you smacked the opponent down even though you didn't, didn't make any argument you just reiterated the doctrines but um there will be those who are on the fence uh those uh who uh, don't have a a strong uh a strong faith in whatever perspective they have who will be shaken you know, and that's what you want to do. You want those on the fence. You want to convince them to our side. Those who are who don't have a, a absolute certainty. You want to shake their faith. And for those on our side who don't have absolute certainty, you want to strengthen their belief. And inshallah, till you get certainty. So these are the benefits that you can um, you can get and attain with debate. It's not for the diehard fanatics on their side or on our side, quote unquote. Right. Um, but rather, it's for those uh, people. Sense. Uh, who um, uh, who who don't have certainty and need that help? Now, if someone has certainty on our side, based on firm evidences and so on, they're not diehard fanatics. These are people of reason, of course. Just to be absolutely clear of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I mean by diehard fanatics are those people who they believe they believe in something due to blind faith. They just adopt it and they will shut out any uh, reasoning, uh, whether to justify why they believe what they believe or why what they believe is wrong. Uh, those obviously is, is a mentality that Muslims shouldn't have. We should always have a reason why uh, we are Muslim and why we believe what we believe, uh, because we can't be those who just blindly follow our forefathers. We must um, base it on certainty. And last but not least, just last point, uh, the manhaj of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who had the Munadra, who had a debate with the Christians of Najran, um, who was for three days and two nights, uh, back and forth debate. And in, at the end of it, they most of them presumably didn't really agree uh with the prophet muhammad uh, and nice no one's no one none of the sahabi said oh well the base is clearly up you know there's no p p point to it in the first place why did you do that or it was pointless no right. none of them ever ever said that so we need to have that mentality of the sahabas um uh, and follow the manhaj of the prophet muhammad and uh the quran in fact by the way the quran in its ayat is actually making debate arguments in a way against the rhetoric of the Quraysh at its time. So in a way, the Quran was engaged in a kind of public debate uh, with them and, they, and their coach, even though it wasn't sitting down with, with a moderator and what have you, but it, it was still engaging their arguments and refuting them. Yeah. I mean, uh, my personal thoughts are that I think that we have a backlash against debating and feel free to disagree or just make no comment about this but i think that <laughs> there are just a lot of a decrease in testosterone and you have these feminized type of people maybe we call them simps who they just don't like conflict they don't like confrontation and the idea of debate is like outside of their entire perspective or worldview of dawah like they understand dawah as oh we just, you know, sit together and have a cup of tea and, you know, talk about our feelings like that's the most effective way to do dawah as opposed to 
uh, as opposed to actually confronting people on their ideas, identifying the core ikhtilaf, as you mentioned, and then arguing on the basis of reason. I think that they like it takes a certain kind of masculinity even uh, to, to see that as acceptable. And people who like, you know, no offense to the sisters, but they do prefer to like get in groups and have, you know, gathering social gatherings and talking about feelings talking about like oh we're all you know friends let's uh, have this kind of friendly attitude that's what they do in front of each other maybe behind their backs <laughs> they're more aggressive and more gossipy but the idea of oh let's have an argument let's have a kind of a fight let's have a fight uh, like a cage match oh that's that's somehow a, that's barbaric that's offensive like no <laughs> we need to just sit and all be friends and sing kumbaya that's what I'm noticing. I think that in the past, and, and you've been debating for so long, mashallah, that maybe you've seen a shift over time. Like you see that now, this is what I would predict, is that as uh, some of these people online have become more and more feminized, men, you know, but they're actually male, feminized males, they are going to express more of a contempt for debating as opposed to the past, maybe 10 or 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Uh, we're getting, you know, getting into the time of Ahmed Didat and uh, Zakir Naik, where no debating is great. Like we want to encourage debate. Maybe we're going to teach Munavara, like this is a part of the Islamic school curriculum. And, you know, that was something seen as something to be celebrated and encouraged in the Muslim community. Whereas now, Maybe there's more reticence. Maybe there's more uh, uneasiness or even outright rejection. We don't want debates. Is that have you observed that, or am I just completely way off? <laughs> um, I would say I'd say I wouldn't say it's it's the active feminization of of Muslim men currently. I'd say it's due to um, it's been it's been there for um, at least half a century or beyond. Um, it's due to the defeated mindset of Muslims after colonialism um, and the decline of Islamic civilization. Um, Muslims uh, adopted this uh, pragmatic, um, no fitna approach, quote unquote, with the term fitna being defined different to what it was in the past. Because before the presence of kufr, the dominance of kufr, the dominance of shirk um, would be called fitna. All right, um, mm -hmm. but now that we redefine it to mean anything that is perturbing or is not easy, um, and that is not what the Sahabas understood uh, by um, uh, uh, fitna. And so, what you get from what I call, um, and I want to be, I want to be clear what I mean by this. So, what I call conservative Muslims, um, you can call them otherwise known as colonialized Muslims or those from post-colonial uh, Muslims. Um, Many of them are defeated. Uh, many of them are, are fatalist, uh, so they believe there's no point doing anything, and they feel that uh, just d resisting or struggling for the dean um, intellectually, even intellectually, um, is going to cause fitna to come down upon us. You're going to make things harder for us. There's going to the people going to get angry with us. Let's let's not uh, rock the boat uh, because they view that ad even advocating Islam um, holistically. Um, is rocking the boat. And I face that um, con continually uh, since we even started uh, uh, kind of uh, doing debating. Um, Ahmed Didat, uh, Rahimallah, uh, who I had the, the honor of meeting two months before he passed away. That's fun. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I was, I mean, Sapana, he was an amazing uh, individual. Uh, I, I was just some, you know, nobody. Um, and I was just passing by. I heard his Ahmedida and they, you know, let me into their house. And I was just some guy off the street, so to speak. I mean, a guy from London, a guy from the UK. Um, but, uh, you know, he he told me, uh, he just had a simple message for me. He said, do da'wah in the UK. Because um, he was always, he was encouraging da'wah to the point, even beyond the point where he could even speak, you know, Sapana. Um, uh, for even though he spent eight to nine years completely paraplegic. Uh, oh, hello. I think we might have lost the connection. Is it on Brother Abdullah's side or is it my side? Can you guys hear me? Hmm. So I think Brother Abdullah might have fallen off. 
uh that's okay we'll just um wait till he gets back on inshallah but that was a interesting story about meeting ahmed didat rahimahullah um let's see you message him Yeah, so I mean, this idea of debate, I want to ask uh, Brother Abdullah, um, it's like a very intriguing connection he's making between this kind of defeatist mentality and not, uh, you know, defeatist mentality when it comes to political defeat. And what I wanted to ask him is this connection between having this defeatist mindset when it comes to reestablishing Khilafa. Um, because this is something that Brother Abdullah has spent a lot of time advocating in his da'wah. Um, and the response that you get from certain defeated, mentally defeated Muslims is that, oh, this is a waste of time. You know, there's no point. You know, let's focus on other issues. Uh, this kind of attitude is very similar, I think. And maybe it's connected to the attitude against debating. And debating is not something that... Uh, Muslims should engage in. It's a waste of time. So we will see uh, if Brother Abdullah can get back on. Yeah, so. But yeah, I want to also ask Brother Abdullah about his experience on uh, TV broadcasts. So if you aren't aware of um, Brother Abdullah's uh, career, he has actually been featured on a lot of uh, TV broadcasts, public broadcasts in the UK on BBC and other TV stations. And those are always fun. Those are always interesting because they will make sure to put the Muslim in a bad position uh, and in a position where he can't really respond and he can't he doesn't have time to explain. The Muslim has to be on the back foot and is being constantly uh, uh, having to react to the kind of unfair questions that are being blasted at him. But we see that Brother Abdullah has done a great job in handling these high pressure scenarios. And that's a skill and talent in and of, it, in and of itself, besides just debating. Like, I think being a good debater is a prerequisite to being able to get on these TV shows and address highly controversial ideas. Like how can you address some of these objections by liberals, like when it comes to uh, polygyny, when it comes to uh, jihad, for example, and explain it in two minutes while you have this antagonistic host who's blasting questions at you and wants to make you and Islam look as bad as possible. So this is, this is something that uh, Brother Abdullah also excels in. We want to get his perspective on that, but he's, uh, I think, still having problems with his connection. So, so speaking of debate, we're um, going to have a debate on this channel, inshallah, this Friday. Uh, we have a debate coming up uh, against a liberal reformist. Um, this is a Zindiq. Uh, reformist uh, from Harvard. He's a PhD student at Harvard. And uh, it was funny. I announced the debate coming up and he uh, uh, basically I described the debate as me versus this arrogant reformist. And people in the replies were saying, oh, Daniel, this is bad. Adab. How can you call him arrogant? And this guy, you know, for years, literally years, like I'm talking about as far back as 2020 has been like constantly messaging me or, or not messaging, but replying to my tweets, uh, writing about me, uh, calling me all kinds of disgusting names, saying that I'm ISIS, like complete slander um, and, you know, just very derogatory stuff, uh, challenging me to debate for like two or three years. <laughs> so then finally, this debate is happening. And I call him arrogant. I call him a zindiq uh, for very good reasons, as we'll see. And he has a problem with it. So catch that debate coming, inshallah, Friday. Um, you can check the channel for your local timing. It's going to be a mega debate because it's going to be over five hours. 
because of all the topics that we're going to cover, traditionalism versus modernism. So you don't want to miss that. And then we have a follow-up debate the next day on Saturday where I'm actually going to debate his organization, which is this liberal organization in the U.S. So you don't want to miss that. Make sure to set your notific notification so you don't miss it, inshallah. Okay, we have Brother Abdullah. He's back. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, sorry, I had a disagreement with my router for some. <laughs> I wanted oh, okay. to be online. My router had a different opinion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> disagreement, yeah. Art of disagreement. So uh, one thing that I want to uh, point out, I did point it out while you're um, offline, but maybe we can get your comment on it, is that this intriguing connection between a defeatist mentality when it comes to politics and especially the reestablishment of Khilafa, which I know you have included as part of your dawah for many years. Um, and then this defeatist mindset when it comes to debate, like we don't want to debate, we don't want to argue. I think that those two are connected, right? Oh, uh, well, very much so. Um, the, I suppose, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big topic as to the, the kind of post-colonial Muslim mindset. One, you could argue that Ibn Khaldun even predicted um, what that mentality would entail for, of a defeated people and how they they operate they will borrow the customs and and beliefs and ideas and values of the conquering people um and they will simulate and they will have no longer any confidence in their own culture their own way of life and their own belief so this was an issue that um uh, faces muslims and so muslims view debate as as causing a um rocking the boat and causing unnecessary aggravation and i've faced many challenges with uh, you, you call MSAs, or we call them ISOCs here, uh, student uh, societies, um, Muslim student societies, who uh, many of them support debate was really great. But then many of them, when you say, look, would you like to uh, host this debate at your venue? It's going to be some groundbreaking topic. Let's, let's, let's um, you know, you, if you can host the university, be great. And many of them said, um, and some of them are, the, the presidents are from actually that they come straight from the Middle East um, and they come from regimes where you don't debate such topics and they'll say i don't see the benefit of debating this kind of topic or or it, it might cause problems uh you know people might not like it what would you mean um i once heard an excuse um was given at um king's college london university we wanted to do a debate there and uh they said the president said that uh we don't like muslim christian debates in this university uh, because last year we had a booth and I said, well, what happened? Was there, was there a fight? Uh, did someone complain to the university about what you were saying? I said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, there was just some raised voices. Um, I said, well, is that it? And, and so for that reason, now you want to like prohibit debates or discussions at, at all. You might as well just give up doing that then because there, there might be heated discussions, uh, heated arguments or, or, or slightly elevated voices. Uh, due to simply calling to the Dean of Islam and calling to Tawheed, right. so that was the kind of mentality. And um, what Ahmadi that did is he gave Muslims confidence uh, again to advocate Islam confidently uh, with robust arguments. And he kind of uh, he, he kind of he lit the spark. Um, Zaki like his his context in India was a little bit different, so he kind of more try to argue uh, that there, that aspects of Islam shouldn't be feared or hated by Hindus because, uh, you know, you can find it in their own traditions, these these values and uh, so on. He tried to kind of be a bit more uh, conciliatory, but still calling to Tawheed anyway, still saying Islam is the truth. Uh, but he tried to do it in a less debating way because his context was, you know, Muslims were a minority and you're having um, an increasingly xenophobic uh, majority uh, uh, kind of uh, Hindu population who are being kind of uh, called to uh, ultra nationalism uh, to, to view Muslims uh, as being um, a threat to the country or what have you. Mm -hmm. So his his context was a little bit different. But in England in the uh, in the late nineties and I would say early two thousands, certainly debate culture kind of started to rise up. There were the the first debates that occurred. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to embarrass a few brothers by naming them. Uh, Sharif Abu Leif, uh, he did, I think, one of the first Muslim atheist debates in English language that I know of in modern times, anyway. As far as if anyone could correct me on that, please. There was an earlier one I would like to know. Um, and then there was obviously Brother Hamza Zortzis, who did, uh, um, he also did Muslim atheism debates, uh, but he also did one of the first 
you could say Muslim uh, versus liberalism uh, debates with with the term liberalism. Before that, uh, there were Muslim organizations, movements, uh, which were organizing debates against capitalism. They called it capitalism. But Hamza also did, did the first debate where, you know, the name of the beast was <laughs> liberalism. Um, and so that's what it started to kind of build up. But then it started to peter out and it's been kind of waxing and waning um, in the UK. I'm not sure about the American scene so much. Uh, or, or in Canada, um, there, there's been very few debates I've seen in um, in North America. But it, what helped is we had these very, um, how should I put this, um, uh, very, uh, well, some might even call them abrasive, uh, these uh, Baptist Christians in from the United States of America, of course, mm -hmm. of all places, uh, who were attacking Islam publicly, openly. Um, uh, uh, there was uh, Nabil Qureshi, David Wood. Uh, Nabil Qureshi was an ex-Qadiani, became Muslim, uh, became a Christian. Uh, David Wood um, said he used to be an atheist, became Christian, but he was these were very evangelical types. And so, funnily enough, uh, the first debates that we could have in the UK, Muslim Christian debates, you could say, was with actually people coming from America. We organizing these these events there, and so uh, Muslim Christian debates was was the thing, right? That was the the most popular of all debates, but soon it started to branch out into other topics. Um, so it's good. But still today we see there's still opposition to, to do debates. Some people um, would still say, what's the point of debates, brother? Or no, why, we don't want to cause fitna. Um, or why are we giving a platform, like as you said, to people who espouse kufr? You're just going to give doubts amongst the minds of the Muslim to say, what, do you have no confidence that the deen of Islam uh, would would win, uh, uh, would uh, completely refute and destroy uh, the kufr ideas and and you know show itself to be the truth and manifest uh it doesn't occur to them they're always worried about oh no if we do this thing you might rock this boat and make things worse for us that is the conservative uh, muslim mindset or the post-colonial muslim mi mindset and i use the word conservative uh, i know muslims get confused with this they think conservative just surely means orthodox no um conservative which is a term that comes out from the western enlightenment by the way and we uh, as muslims we always borrow western enlightenment terms um it means pe people who want to conserve the status quo and they are um, they eschew uh, any changes or radical changes that could disturb things, right? That's what conservatism means in Western Enlightenment thinking. That's why they are conservatives in the West. They don't like radical changes. They were worried about the French Revolution. And so they, you know, Edmund Burke was kind of like um, the philosopher of that. So when Muslims adopt, uh, when I call Muslims conservative, uh, particular kinds of Muslims who are post-colonial products, you could say. Um, so products of the of the of Western colonialism. Uh, they're very secularized. Uh, they think that, that an Islamic system is just. It might be as idealistic, but like King Arthur and Camelot. It's like it's a fantasy. And they, they you know, they'll say, you know, we 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 uh, we we follow the obligations of Islam. Oh, but on the obligation of Khilafah, obligation of unity, obligation of implementing the Deen of Islam. It is law systems that protects the very values and practices of 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 you know, Muslim family in my life, Muslim societal norms. All oh, these things. Oh, it's not absolutely necessary. It's okay. We all all wait for the Mahdi or a whole number of excuses to do absolutely nothing, uh, which is clearly what the the Sahabas did not have that mentality when it comes to um, implementing the Deen of Islam. So. Uh, conservative Muslims are, are, are a label I give to those who want to conserve the status quo and they're scared of any changes. And you might make a good argument to say that simply adopting a conservative mentality um, of, of being scared of change, uh, while it's at the same time being in an inferior position um, militarily, politically, economically in the world, could contribute to a, a emasculation of men. Uh, that could be an argument that you could make, yes. Uh, but but that came first before you could say whatever feminism is doing in the West. Um, uh, that would be a different discussion anyway. But yeah, hmm. yeah, conservative is like a mushtarak type of term. It can uh, apply to many different contexts and meanings. So it's funny, like your definition of conservative, like conserving the status quo. Like that's what I consider to be like a liberal Muslim. A liberal Muslim is the one who says that you know that we have a liberal world hegemony we have this liberal status quo and we we like that we want to you know enjoy this religious freedom quote unquote um and this feminism and this uh, these liberal structures these liberal institutions that's what we we like so they're liberal muslims in that they appreciate that but i can say, definitely see your definition of conserving conserving the status quo or the liberal status quo so but uh they can apply well, I, to Muslims I, I in the them, sense of 
cons- I couldn't conserving first wave. the Quran and Sunnah, conserving yeah. like the practice, like the tradition. We want to conserve the tradition of Islam. So it can uh, it can be applied in multiple ways, I think. Uh, well, I mean, as I said, the, the term conservatism, it, it comes from the West. It's a Western term. It was never used in um, Islamic literature prior to colonialism, um, which is why I, I would ask, you know, Muslims always use um, adjectives or rather just the name Muslim to refer to themselves as opposed to these things that came uh, relatively recently. Um, but you could say they sound like liberals. Uh, well, uh, conservatives, you know, the, there was this, um, uh, the, a, a Euro, the British governor, or a kind of a kind of governor general um, of Egypt during British colonialism, uh, Lord Cromer. Um, he he was a conservative in England, right? And he was making changes uh, to Egypt, Egyptian institutions, uh, creating an education system that was Westernized. And he labeled this new the g- generation of Egyptians that they were creating called Europeanized uh, Egyptians. They were secular, but they weren't liberal. And he argued that the, the Muslim world wasn't yet uh, ready for liberalism, full-on liberalism. But there was this kind of first wave. The first wave is like the you know uh, the, the secular undercoat before you put in the liberal overcoat, right? Yeah. So the undercoat is what I would call um, the the conservative Muslim. They are usually apolitical. Uh, they usually keep religion out of politics, um, whether they are religious or not. Re- regardless, uh, they deem it to be a fitna to introduce. Uh, Islam into politics in only just the most abstract terms, such as justice or peace or whatever. But then they then they kind of put Islam aside and they allow whatever is the current European institutions in the Muslim world um, and uh, the political institutions of the Muslim world to to take effect and to rule. So, uh, in effect, uh, conservative Muslims uh, are, are are modernists and reformists uh, in, in a sense. Um, not just they're not just liberal Muslims are. Uh, but liberal Muslims are like the inevitable direction of where Muslim, where the Muslim world will go if we don't um, have a serious movement to implement the Deen of Islam holistically. So sure. conservative Muslims are stage one, but stage two is is uh, full on liberalism uh, in the Muslim world, and you can see this happening in many countries in the Middle East. Uh, just just take example of Saudi Arabia with its um, uh, its liberalizing policies. Now uh, they were just waiting for the people to allow it to be so apathetic that they. Uh, wouldn't object and they but they're always going in that direction and so lord cromer he wrote a book uh, you can get it you can see it online uh it's called modern egypt written in 1920 or right 1919 uh, uh, um and i am shocked by how the insight he has not only into the muslim mind that he's creating and and the mindset but the future plans and the future objectives that britain was creating in the in the muslim world he said that a europeanized muslim um is no longer Muslim. Is no longer they give up, uh, they give up their Islamism. Now he used the word Islamism to mean Islam, but back then Islamism um, was was the word for Islam uh, used mm-hmm. by the British. So, um, and uh, because by he said he said a reformed Islam is Islam no more. So this is really um, I was shocked by just how ex- how um, open he was explaining exactly what they were going to do. And Egypt, and this is what I mean by the conservative Muslim, conserving the, the tradition of Islam, uh, the Quran, and so on and so forth. I, I mean, um, it's it's like well, the it's I would I would perhaps not like to kind of use terms which are ambiguous, such that they are they have uses in the West which are well understood. Um, I don't view that there is a thing called conservative Muslim. There only is Muslim as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam intended, as the Sahabas called themselves, they just called themselves uh, Muslim, and so I think that's the the name I would um, strongly advocate. We mm-hmm. restrict ourselves to. So we have a modern day debate is here. James is in the chat. How's it going, James? Good to see you. Um, so let's uh, talk about your appearances on TV. Um, people might not know this that you've. Uh, had a long career appearing on public broadcast television in the UK. Uh, one of the type of TV shows I remember that you'd often go on is the big questions. Uh, so that's something that is frustrating, but also entertaining because they never seem to give you enough time to answer the questions. So any memorable experiences from that show? And how how was your experience like sitting on a panel and people who are very different and have completely different perspectives? 
and you have to somehow manage to all speak in a very short program. Well, I, I call this, um, you've heard of asymmetric warfare, where, for example, you're fighting an army that has you know, tanks, planes, uh, artillery, and you're an insurgent force, what have you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have a strong army, but you have you can you can choose where you where you your battles are, and you can uh, hit them um, uh, in, in uh, where they don't expect. Um, so I call this um, asymmetric dawa, right? Mm -hmm. Which is uh, you enter into deliberately unfair um, platforms, and of course, you know they can say whatever they want. They can uh, give themselves the majority of time. They can even mute mute your mic uh, as well without you realizing it, because it's mm -hmm. what is recorded and. It, it, when you're in the stage, you don't see yourself muted because you're talking and everyone in the stage can hear you. But to the audience back home, they're muted. But they, by dint of them inviting you, they do give you a, a, a finite, but still they give you an amount of time mm -hmm. for you to say whatever you need to say, whatever you want. And right. so I use that time to be uh, as disruptive as possible uh, against the falsehood uh, and against the, the false paradigms that are being uh, touted by uh, the, the the program, and that usually means that yes, I don't get much time, and yes, they cut me off. But what I do say, um, I, I get to do is, you know, I say a, a bee might be small, but it can sting you, right? So uh, I say things which uh, stay in people's, uh, or at least I I endeavor to say things that stay in people's minds. Um, and you, you th there's all kinds of things I've been able to uh, to pull off um, while I was at, on the big questions. Um, for example. Uh, I was invited for one particular topic. I forgot what it was, but there was there was like usually they debate uh, two or three topics, and they invite you maybe usually for one topic to discuss out of the three topics. But anyone can chime in on any of the other topics if you just want to. You'd say I want to speak. So they had this topic on: uh, d Does gambling uh, require further regulation? Okay, and so uh, they were they had a Muslim sister who was like I think involved in politics there, a muhajiba, but uh, but she was touting. Uh, well, she wasn't really. Uh, uh, kind of advocating the Islamic position, shall we say. So she was just simply saying that, yeah, out, out, gambling does deserve more regulation. And maybe she thought that, you know, well, if we regulate it more, that's closer to the Islamic perspective. We'll say, well, no, that's not close to the Islamic perspective. The Islamic perspective is we outlaw uh, gambling. And so I asked to speak and they thought maybe I'd make the same argument or a similar argument. And I know I started to argue from first principles why gambling is not uh, even it is not an economic transaction, uh, a game of chance where there's not services being transacted, there's not a commodities being transacted. It is a parasite um, economical ph phenomena, and it usually preys on the poor. So uh, I made these arguments, and there were people from both sides: those wanting to pro-regulate more, uh, those who wanted to have less regulation, and it ended up no one actually being able to argue against me. Um, they just argued into silence because they weren't expecting someone to come on to say, we should just ban it. Why don't we just ban it? You know, the elephant in the room. Why don't we just ban it? So I got to be able to do things like this. Um, uh, there was there were debates when uh, now I, I know they are trying to trap me every single time I go on. And they you, they, you can usually tell because they, they ask me a leading question. Uh, and, and it's all usually far away from the main question topic, which is meant to be debated by everybody. in there. And they usually give someone. Uh, who, who, who opens the topic, uh, two minutes of undisturbed time to say whatever they want with me. Within 20 seconds, I get cut off uh, by um, the host. And uh, so I've, I've been able to play a few games with the host, um, including making it clear to everybody that he cuts me off and, it, and he's scared to let me speak. And he, even his own fans online, you can see on Twitter, people saying I was following uh, 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 Nikki Campbell, who was the host for many years, a big fan of him. But but now he's slipping now because why did he do this and why did he not let the Muslim guy speak? So uh, th there was that. But how's the relationship with him with that guy? With the host? Uh, well, I won't be getting any Christmas cards. Let's just put it like that on, uh, <laughs> from him anyway. Um, so um, oh, and that, like he used to be just you know, give me a polite front, but now he just doesn't speak to me in the green room at, at all whatsoever. <laughs> it's um, but. I like to even manipulate them. Uh, so what they usually do before the program is they they have a researcher call you up and ask you, uh, you know, well, here's some of the questions. What what would you say to this? What would you say to that? They want to know what you're going to say. The debate is very choreographed. Uh, they don't tell people what to say on the day, but they know what you're going to say, and they try to put people in the different positions and and give people different times. So um, they invited Ahmadi or Kadiani uh, on the show 
uh, on a show about Islam and what have you, and they were they were going to position the Ahmadi as just another, you know, uh, part of Islam, not a sect of Islam or school of thought of Islam, uh, which is clearly not the case. Um, they, they are outside the fold of Islam very clearly. Um, so, but they they didn't ask, they didn't bring me on to to do that to, to do takfir of him, what have you. They were just bringing me on for some other discussion, but they were going to bring this guy to include him. On the discussion so the researcher concluded her questions to me and i said oh by the way uh, you know the ahmadi guy you have on yeah um well ahmadiyya is not part of islam uh so this is this is a not uh this they don't represent islam they're not part of islam i a reason why i said that was because i knew nikki campbell would be told um get a make sure abdul andalusi says this publicly on tv he does open takfir of <laughs> this ahmadi and looks like a takfiri <laughs> right so I was ready and waiting for, for Nikki Campbell to then say, uh, Abdullah, but do you consider him to be a Muslim? And I was ready and waiting. And I was saying, well, the, the real question, I just turned around, the real question is, considering that he, his guy, his, um, he believes in this new prophet after Islam, uh, where he, uh, he, they, which they oblige everyone to believe in, otherwise you're not a Muslim. The question is, does he consider me to be a Muslim then? Mm. Um, because his so-called prophet says that everyone who doesn't believe in him are disbelievers and then i said that uh you know i pointed out what's the point of having him on he's like to islam as mormons are to christianity and now when i said that all the non-muslims got it like oh ahmadiyya are not like some just school of thought they yeah. are a full-blown separate sect like not sect they are uh, outside the fold of islam and so I've uh, I had some fun, and of course the Ahmadi was tripping over himself trying to answer why his so-called prophet did takfir of anyone who didn't believe in it, which would include myself. Whereas prior to that, the Ahmadi was positioning himself as a live and let live. Everyone's a Muslim, and you know why don't why don't people just accept us? And no, you guys do takfir because we don't accept your false prophet. So um, I, I had some fun on the, on the big questions for many different shows. Yeah, that's great. That's a very funny experience, and. Um, yeah, I really enjoy all your appearances on that show because if it if it weren't you, like who is who are they gonna bring as the representative of Islam? Like probably some Zindiq or maybe even a Qadiani and, and passing him off as a as a Muslim. So um, may Allah reward you for your efforts on on that show. And I know it's not easy; it can't be easy. Uh, but this kind of leads to our next question um, because you're kind of indicating this tactic of turning the tables like you put the opposition on the back foot going on the offense making them defensive um but i think that's one important tactic tactic in debate but what do you think is the most important tactic or the most important factor for actually winning debates well th that depends your uh, your audience um so it depends the context of the debate uh if there's a non-Muslim audience, um, usually it's in, a, in a it's in a debating institution, like a, a debating union. Uh, so it's, it's a student society, usually a reputable one, like the Oxford Union. Everyone's quite famous. Cambridge Union, not as famous, but uh, you know, uh, maybe older than the Oxford Union a little bit. And recently, the Durham Union, which I appeared in. Um, so these are famous debating institutions, which were established uh, at the beginning of the turn of the 19th century, um, and. Uh, Many politicians, uh, famous British politicians, were formerly members of these debating unions and they participate in public debates. Uh, so you have many people who will be movers and shakers of the future uh, going through these, these debating unions. So usually they have a motion. And um, the, the issue is that some of these motions are quite critical. Some are not so critical. So I, I've been in debates where it says this house believes uh, this house would be proud to be patriotic. Um, or in my case, would not be proud to be patriotic. Was I think was the uh, the motion, and I was on the proposition that we were not we should not be proud to be patriotic. Uh, some debates are just about they mention religion. You know, this house welcomes the decline of organized religion, um, or this house would separate uh, religion and state. Very broad ones. But then you you get debates which mention the word Islam specifically in it, which is um, this house believes Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, this how this house believes Islam is a threat to civil Western civilization. Or threat to the West. Um, I, I, I participated in that debate in the Cambridge Union. Um, there was one, uh, this house blames the West for Islamic extremism, which I interpreted to mean, you mean just terrorism by people who might be ostensibly called Muslims. Is that, if that's what you mean, uh, then I argued, yes, the West is to blame for this because you don't see, you don't see um, 
Brazil being attacked by Muslims or having uh, suffered from terrorism, or Switzerland or Rep Ireland, Republic of Ireland, why or Sweden? Uh, because there's, there's they don't in, get involved in in wars around the country, bombing people and killing people. So I made that simple argument in the debate. And uh, recently there was a debate on um, uh, this house believes Islam is compatible with human rights. Uh, which I I don't obviously accept that Islam is compatible with liberal human rights or what many Westerners believe to be human rights. But I didn't pick the title, but I can reinterpret it any way I want, which I did during the debate. Um, and I'd be able to turn the tables on them. And Alhamdulillah, in these debates, if Muslims are seen to be are seen to lose, if the, if the de debate motion is seen to lose, then uh, Islamophobes or, or people who hate Islam uh, and hate Muslims and want to deprive Muslims of rights will use this as a moral victory to push forward more um, restrictive measures on Muslims practicing Islam in the West. And it's only for that reason I, I go onto those platforms and I'm faced with a non-Muslim audience. Now you see how to win those debates. Uh, well, um, uh, oh, I'll tell you something shocking actually. Um, jokes win debates. <laughs> right, uh, jokes win. Uh, I, I, it's a it's a funny it's a funny human phenomenon. But uh, you know, many Islamophobes go on and they're just ranting and angry and hateful individuals. And for non-Muslims who might not support Islam, maybe they even disagree with Islam, but they see these individuals and they say, "Oh, I really don't like that person." <laughs> right? It's like, is that's the they don't really seem like a reasonable person. Um, but when you tell jokes, it it lowers their guard to you. They're like, oh, this person's not some um, kind of uh, crazy individual or person. Uh, you know, if someone jokes with you, uh, jokes to you, you can't hate them and you can't fear them. Right. And then it lowers their defenses, um, the, the irrational defenses they put up and uh, opens their minds to a, a reasonable argument to make. So I know it sounds funny to say that. And I wish humans didn't work like this. I wish humans would merely as you say, respond purely to just intellectual weight of intellectual argument uh, without uh, emotionality. But uh, jokes win debates. And so I always try to uh, make a few jokes to non-Muslim audience, um, make them seem which, approachable. Which joke got the biggest laugh, laugh if you can remember? Um, I said a few. Um, but I, I, I said, uh, I, I remember once opening up a discussion, I said, um, uh, I'm, it was it was actually a topic which was more about I think uh, disestablishing the Church of England from from um, state, uh, uh, but was a part of a motion religion, uh, religion from state being separate. Because uh, in England technically they're not separate uh, mm -hmm. officially or legally speaking, they're not they're not fully separate. There's like 33, I think it's 33 or 32, uh, Lord Spiritual in the House of Lords, which is basically uh, member clergymen of the House of clergymen of the Church of England. Uh, they preside, they have fixed positions that preside on laws of this country in the House of Lords, the second house in this in this country. So technically speaking, you could say, is it a theocracy or is it part of theocracy? Um, but um, so I was in this, they invited me to this debate, to this discussion. And I thought, OK, I said, hello, everybody, I'm here to talk about um, a religion that came uh, from the Middle East, uh, where, you know, it sounds foreign to the people of this land to the, when it came. Uh, you know, people who convert to this religion usually change their names to you know, uh, Semitic, uh, Semitic words, and you know the the religion was was based around a Middle Eastern prophet, and uh, the rituals are, 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 are were strange initially to the, to the natives of this country. And I said, "Yes, you guessed it. I'm talking about Christianity," mm -hmm. and everyone erupted in laughter and then clapped because they, "Oh, you got us, right? You you actually <laughs> you actually got us." Is there? Because well, yeah, that, that's exactly what I said. Exactly true. It applies exactly to Christianity. Um, so those kinds of things, just to kind of make little make little jokes to the audience. Um, but then I suppose when you're asking me what wins the debates ultimately um, is uh, two things. You need to uh, you need to take control of the framing of the question or the meaning behind the question that people are debating. Uh, if you control the question, you control the answer. It's as simple as that. Um, and you know, many Muslims. Uh, are, are, in, are invited onto TV to, to do debates where the question has been kind of uh, formulated in such a way that it almost um, determines that they have to answer it a certain way. And it's usually the way that, that the media want them to answer that question. You're like, you know, do Muslims, are, uh, is Islam opposed to LGBT or what have you? Or is Islam opposed to homosexuality? Um, uh, or there was a question, can you be gay and Muslim? Was a, was a debate I went on on the BBC. Um, and it was such a, you know, it was very... You know, kind of disingenuous framing of it. Because what what do you mean? Can you be gay and Muslim? Do you mean can you have same sex attraction? 
all right but be a muslim you know but but you you have just a, a attra you you are attracted to people of the same sex you don't do anything about it but can you be a muslim or um you know is it simply you know um, can you uh, can you have sex with say, with with members of the opposite sex of the same sex and still be muslim so the, it's a very vague and so if a muslim says no you can't the westerner hears that you're saying that if someone has same sex attraction that they can't that they obviously didn't choose that desire per se that they can't be a Muslim, they can't say the Shahada and embrace Islam, even if they were righteous, uh, which is not what we believe in. But so it was very vaguely, uh, kind of um, uh, vaguely worded question to guarantee a particular answer. They wanted Muslims on the show to say, "No, no, you can be gay and Muslim, and you know, uh, or and and you shouldn't judge and a whole bunch of stuff," um, which is not, which is uh, alhamdulillah wasn't the conclusion because I, I. I I disrupted the whole discussion <laughs> um, and I managed to turn it around, which I'll get to that in a second. But uh, so re in my recent debate, the topic house believes Islam is compatible with human rights. Um, I don't believe Islam is compatible with um, with what the West considers it to, to be human rights. Uh, so I changed the, the question around. I said, look, uh, what, what do you mean by human rights? Because no one can agree on any particular right. You can't agree. In England, you don't have the right to bear arms. Right in America, oh, you suddenly do have the right to bear arms, just by geographical location. Is it is it a universal right? Is it not a universal right? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom to be to utter racist slurs in America. That's part of the freedom of speech. In England, you don't have that freedom uh, of speech, right. and yet they all consider it to be you know human rights. So I, I made these arguments, and um, I, I actually was going to make an argument, though I forgot to make it on the day. But I was going to say, for example. Uh, you believe that men and women are equal, so men and women have equal reproductive rights, right? Well, no, because if a man wants to abort his his uh, his fetus or what have you, he doesn't have that right. But if the but the woman can decide to keep the fetus, and then he has to pay money, whether he likes it or not, on the decision made by uh, the other person in the couple. So a man does not have equal reproductive rights. I, I, I use that. I made an argument against an atheist uh, once in a debate. Um, I said that uh, even in your Western system, you don't treat people equally based on biology. And he actually couldn't say anything. And um, I, and I, I kind of, uh, <laughs> I, I might have been a bit more cocky back then. I, I said, well, exactly. And I dropped the mic on the, <laughs> on the table. But but um, in the debate I did at Durham Union, where I, I redefined the term, I said, look, human rights doesn't mean anything because we can't agree. So, but what does, what do you mean? What does it mean to have rights for humans in the first place? We're simply that rights for humans simply means that there's a set of rights that no human, whether they're the leader or the, the society, can ever change. And it's a rights which are given to humans that no other human being can take away arbitrarily. Uh, and, and I then argue that's the only possible meaning you can ever have of rights because all the meanings don't make sense. And certainly the, the term freedom makes no sense unless you're an anarchist. Um, and once the, I, I, I argued that and they accepted that, then I simply said, well, look, Islamic Islam's rights, you might not agree with them, but they are inviolable. The, the leader can't take them away and society can't take them away. And, and I said, and, and my, my opponents were saying, oh, what about, you know, uh, you know apostasy and uh, jihad and, and slaves and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and I, then I reiterated at the very end, look, it doesn't, you don't have to agree with Islam, but the, the opposition has failed to show that Islam doesn't have an inviolable set of rights that cannot be taken away by the leader or the or the people, and the the debating union, the students there, they usually talked about debating logic and you know uh, how to uh, how to argue. Uh, they a majority of non-Muslim audience accepted it, and then they voted in for the proposition that Islam was compatible with human rights, as I defined it, compatible with um, rights for humans that is inviolable, as in that Islam has a, con a concept of rights which is inviolable that is given to human beings that no human being can take away. So I changed the definition of the question mm -hmm. and, and we won um, based on that. So that's how, yep. you win, that's, that's how you win that debate in, in general though. And to win any debate, as they say, um, if you want a more formulaic answer, it is the side that gives uh, an explanation that, that is, the, is the most consistent and is the broadest. So it explains all the evidence or, or more evidence than the other side and it's consistent. Uh, that's a more, if you like a formulaic answer, then I can give you that too. <laughs> sure. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit and get a little bit less formal, uh, maybe a little bit off topic. I know you didn't want me to ask you any personal questions, but I can't help myself. Um, what do you consider to be your favorite cuisine? 
<laughs> That's <laughs> favorite cuisine, Sapala. Anything tasty, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, the well, tastiest. Com- com- tasted. Uh, coming from a Mediterranean background, um, albeit, you know, Portuguese, what have you, but uh, anything Italian is usually tasty. Okay. Uh, so Any no, particular, you like the chicken parm, you like the, you know, ravioli, and uh, what exactly from Italian cuisine? Uh, anything involving uh, pasta, cheese, and tomato. Uh, <sighs> there's, there's some combination the Italians discovered after yeah. the tomato was discovered in the new world and they just made it into something that was uh, uh legendary so anything that although i can eat anything i like all kinds of cuisines but uh italian just can't be beat yeah we uh, recently tried making pizza at home like uh my wife actually cooking uh the or making the dough from scratch like we using flour and yeast and we made some really good pizza so I don't know if you've tried it, but that's always a fun experience, and the kids love it. So, okay, well, if ever I pass by Houston, um, I'll expect some um, Italian hospitality. In that yeah, inshallah, <laughs> we'll treat you. We'll treat you to some good pizza and pasta, inshallah. Lasagna, oh, my favorite is lasagna. Uh, okay, so let's uh, talk about um, your debate record, uh, just like rapid. You know, the first thing that comes to your mind. What is the most memorable debate that you've had? Uh, I'll I'll give you three, uh, unfortunately, because <laughs> I, I I don't know, but very quick, I, I I can't tell which one is the best because they they're all good in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I did a debate on BBC called um, "Can You Be Gay and Muslim," uh, mm-hmm. and I was invited on to be the ranting fanatic Muslim. That wasn't the role they wanted to me to fulfill. And I just turned the tables. Um, yeah, I said it was, it's, it's a sinful practice, uh, you know, but, uh, uh, but we also view alcohol to be sinful. We view pork to be sinful as Muslims. And so uh, non-Muslims don't, in a way, don't have a right to, to say, oh, how dare you be intolerant? Uh, because then no one would say you're being intolerant to pork eaters or al- alcoholics because we've deemed that to be, um, uh, you know, s- sinful. And of course, drinking alcohol is quite a serious sin too. Your, your salah is not accepted. For a number of days after drinking alcohol, so I simply said that you know we view these things to be sinful, um, so you can't um, have an issue with us Muslims. But then I turned the tables around on them. I said, "You are the discriminators, not us." And they say, "Well, what's going on?" I say, "Well, because you invented a term to delineate people based on their uh, sexual preference uh, or desires." Uh, in the late 19th century, this is where this, these terms homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual was developed by you guys. You began categorizing humans into those categories, and then you then treated them differently based on those categories. So, uh, And you are doing it today by calling them a different category. You're literally discriminating uh, them. As Muslims, we just view humans to be obviously all uh, just human beings. We don't make that categorization. You're either, you're either a believer or a disbeliever, but... Um, you know, a fasic or not, or, or someone who is idle and just and righteous. Um, but we don't discriminate based on desires. It's like me saying uh, we have this um, spread on toast called Marmite. Uh, it's like a yeast-based spread. Um, maybe in Australia they call it Vegemite. I, I don't know what they call it in America if they even have it there. And I say, you know, in England there's a little joke about whether you either you hate it or you like it. You know, there's no in-between. And I say it's like, you know, the, the Marmite-loving community and the Marmite-hating community, and they have political rights and the culture. It's just ridiculous, right? So I said that in, in the Quran or Sunnah, there is no word for a person that simply has desires of that nature. Uh, it is, this is an invention, modern invention by the West. You create the problem of discrimination, and now you're foisting it upon us. You discriminate, not us. We just consider people to be humans, whether sinful or not sinful, but still human. So I turned it around against them. And they weren't expecting that because this is the first time they've ever heard such an argument. Um, mm-hmm. So I put them on the defensive. That was one. Two was um, I did a debate um, on, it was after the Charlie Hebdo, uh, the magazine, that French magazine that did disgusting cartoons against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, the BBC uh, showed uh, a front cover of the, the magazine, just a, a front cover. The front cover, uh, they picked one that I suppose they, did, they didn't deem to be controversial, but just to show uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine as an example of what it looks like. And so people were complaining about that, saying that they shouldn't have given this this uh, magazine um, the, the ability to show an image of itself. Uh, the BBC shouldn't have shown it, shouldn't, shown it in the first place. And uh, right after this shooting, you know, 
temperaments were very high. People were like, oh, this, you know, free speech and Western sort of civilization under attack. So there was a debate, I think it was at the Manchester Debating Union, and it was this house regrets um, the repu republication of the, the Charlie Hebdo uh, magazine. Uh, in, in by the BBC or whatever, right? uh, the republication of it. So when we, this is what I call two voting debate. Uh, so they 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 took a, a vote of everyone in the audience. Well, what would you believe about this? And the vast majority were against it, saying we don't regret it. This is free speech, and we're here to defend it. And I did an argument um, in that debate where, and this is more like the art uh, an, an art of debate type appreciation of it, which is um, I argued that look, uh, you know, m there are people on my side. There was an imam that came on my side. And he was talking about. You know that free speech isn't unlimited and there was people on the other side who saying no oh, free speech you know you should be able to say what have you and i i said look i'm not going to convince non-muslim audience in a short amount of time uh that free speech has limits some they, they, they believe that themselves but it's hard right now because they're very emotional and so i said okay i said look today i'm i'm, I'm not going to be arguing today um about you know where the limits of free speech are or what have you i'm simply going to say that just because you have a right to do something you might think you have a right to do something doesn't mean that you uh, should always exercise that right. It's always wise to exercise that right, right? And I made such an argument that that you know, um, I think Mark Twain said. I'm, I'm going to butcher his quote. Um, he said it was a West typical Western mindset. He said like, "Thank God we have um, uh, freedom to do what we want, and the wisdom never to do never to use it." <laughs> right? Um, so. I simply showed that look. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to be making an argument today about this because that's going to be a bit too a, a bridge too far for the for the the time I have. I'm simply going to say, can we not simply just regret that the BBC this, uh, shared it, considering that it is um, it is extremely insulting and it's not designed for it, the the pursuit of truth, right? What's the point of free speech? It's meant to be the pursuit of truth. How does that pursuit truth by mocking? and insulting and denigrating and alhamdulillah by the end of that um debate not only did the, did the well they did a second vote and we had changed it was a sea change the audience had completely gone over to our side by the end of that at a very emotionally charged debate so that one was quite memorable because it was an uphill battle to change people's minds when they were very emotionally charged about them like charlie hebdo shooting had just happened there was that and the last one i'll leave you with and that's quite and, and it's the funniest um I call it method debating, right? Um, you heard of method acting, right? Mm -hmm. Where an actor pretends to live as a character in order to uh, uh, to kind of uh, to to better represent it during the, fi the filming. So I was debating. This is in two thousand nine, and I was debating David Wood. You, you, obviously, you're well aware of David Wood, uh, who he is. So we had just done a debate on is Islam a religion of peace, uh, and uh, we, we were going to do debate on is Christianity a religion of peace. Uh, so in, in that previous debate, I had argued that Islam is a religion of peace because it aims to create peace. Uh, now, it might involve warfare, but the end goal is peace. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a pacifist religion, uh, but rather it, you know, it's the end goal. But it has a means to do so. And though in this debate, is Christianity a religion of peace? I argued exactly the same thing because Christians actually, um, the idea of just war theory is the same. But I, but I know that David Wood, uh, he's actually, he's a, as you put it as well, he's a liberal Christian. He's not really a, an orthodox, you know, historic Christian who reads the Bible and takes it, what the Bible says and its values 100%. It's been modified by the, the liberal context he lives in. So I said in that debate, I was this was in a church, the, the audience were majority Christian. I wore a, a turban and jalabiya, um, uh, stylistic choices. I quite like the look. Um, but... Uh, we were debating this, and I said, "Today, I'm not going to be arguing as a Muslim. I'm not going to be arguing Muslim. I'm going to be arguing as a Christian, right?" And I brought four. I said, "I brought four of the the grand shiur, right, uh, of um, Christianity: uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, Thomas Aquinas, uh, and Saint Augustine." Uh, and and I just I just prepared, and I just spouted that quotations from them i sh i gave tafsir of the bible their their tafsir of the bible to david wood and they was like this is typical what muslims say this is typical what muslims do they try to interpret the bible like this to make us look bad it's like no 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 I, where did i say it I, I i didn't say it i i literally just quoted what they said and subhanallah by the end of that debate um the christians when it was a q a 
the Christians kept asking questions of David Wood. Like, but how can you say this? And why do you say this? I got to the point that the moderator said, uh, does anyone have any questions for the Muslim? <laughs> right? So the, so um, I made David Wood look like a Christian heretic in a sense, or, or, or at least an Anabaptist. The, the Christians who are pacifists, they, they believe there's absolutely no warfare. And then David Wood said, well, I, I didn't say that you can't engage in some warfare. And then I asked him, um, you know, what about the Iraq war? What about, and then I, I, I hooked him onto that. So you think that was just, you think that was fine. And he didn't want to commit to that. But, um, but the funny aspect of that debate was not that I got the Christians to turn against David Wood and I revealed him to be a liberal, what have you. I got, unfortunately, uh, and, I, and I didn't realize this until I watched it back. I got so into the role of arguing purely from a Christian perspective. because I, di I didn't want him to say, this is a Muslim misinterpretation of the Bible. I wanted to say, no, this is purely and totally a Christian interpretation of the Bible from across all the different madhahib of, the, of Christianity, right? The, 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 the top four guys, these are not like, like uh, you know, uh, guys off the street. These are top four guys. Um, I accidentally said, uh, like you know, uh, uh, this is not how we interpret. You know, uh, we uh, almost like we mm -hmm. Christians interpret. And I was like, oh my god, did I say we? Mm -hmm. I got so into it. I accidentally kind of referred to my, uh, to us, uh, the us, uh, the, to, uh, the as Christ, you know, the audience and myself as as like us. You know, and it's like, oh. Why did I say that yeah. uh, stuff? Allah, that was uh, that was a slip. But I got so involved into the method. But alhamdulillah, there was no voting in that debate. But if you could judge it by what people were saying afterwards and and the Q and A, uh, David Wood lost it because he wasn't arguing me against me as a Muslim. He was arguing against his own orthodoxy, and I turned it around him, made it a debate between Christian orthodoxy and his liberal pacifist reinterpretation of religion. So that was the debate. Um, I find anyway. I find funny. Anyway, I thought it was, yeah. it was interesting. If you could debate anyone uh, from today, you know, any living person, who would you debate? Uh, there's a few. Um, I would say recently, recent. Uh, well, I, I'd say it, it's it's Ben Shapiro. I'd like to debate. Um, I would like to debate him on Zionism. Um, he needs to get called out. Um, uh, Wolfowitz as well uh, on Zionism. I'd like to debate him. Um, but I'd also like to debate um, Jordan Peterson uh, as well. Have a one-on-one. -on -one. Although he's very guarded about the platforms uh, that he gives. So he he usually will say, you know, uh, you can't record it. I record it. And you have to agree to these terms and conditions. And he and if he, if it goes badly for him, I can only assume that he might not publish it if it goes really badly for him and i would just simply like to argue to I, i'd simply like show a mirror to him and say uh jordan peterson uh, and i've been saying this for a long time by the way i've been telling people about this for a long time jordan peterson you hate postmodernism for all the hate against postmodernism that you level you are a postmodernist you don't take the bible literally you you take it as allegories that might be useful for individual interpretations that might uplift the mentality of individual people uh, so you're looking at it as purely as it's as it's pragmatic or its practical benefit, but not whether it is a meta narrative that is true or not in and of itself. You are a postmodernist, uh, Jordan Peterson. Embrace your community, right? <laughs> Don't deny it. I would, I would, uh, I would love to to, uh, to be able to say that to him uh, face to face. Yeah, that's good. Good choices. Um, how about in history? Anyone in history, like at any point, would you? Who would you want to debate? Um, I'd say Christopher Hitchens. Uh, I mean, I know he did he did some debates with um, with people in the past. Uh, he was deemed to be very uh, good at rhetoric, um, very eloquent, and so he would it would have been a good challenge. I would have enjoyed the challenge of that debate with, with him. Uh, but he passed away due to uh, esophageal cancer, so he'll be he'll you can you can he'll be no longer uh, giving oratory to his ideas anymore. Uh, but if if there was one I could have debated in, you know, um, I could resurrect to just temporarily debate him. I would, uh, it would be that guy. Sure. So here's a more of a conceptual question about your own personal history, uh, because you've been involved in Dawa for, you know, about two decades or, or more. Um, maybe even more. Making right? me sound old now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah, may Allah preserve you. But how have, do you think that your Dawa has evolved over the years? Um, or been mostly consistent? Like, what do you think are the biggest changes? Okay, well, first and foremost, I want to be absolutely clear about this. Um, I've made tons of mistakes. Um, I'm my own worst critic. Um, 
I'm never happy with my work. <laughs> and um, I, I've I've sometimes failed to perform in the best way I, I felt. Uh, you know, what they call, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you kick yourself in the shower, like, oh, I could have said this, I could have said that. Um, sometimes I phrase things incorrectly. Sometimes I, I might have inadvertently used terms and ideas which um, are, are linked to Western concepts. And, I, and then I let, and only I realized, oh, I shouldn't have said that like, like, like that. Um, so what I would say is this, that, um, you know, uh, throughout my past, if anyone ever sees anything I've said, which is reprehensible uh, or questionable, uh, if they would at least message me first, as, do me the courtesy as a Muslim brother to uh, to message me, I will, without any reservation, publicly apologize for it, retract it um, on all my media platforms. Um, so at least do me the courtesy of the, the right of first retraction. At least let me uh, let me correct myself before that you know you do an expose videos, um, because I've made mistakes. Right? I've made um, I've made errors. Maybe some people might view these errors as not that big, or uh, so, or, or, or th they might make him out and out of a molehill um and they oh this is very big um or they might misconstrue but at least i would say that i've made mistakes and i've learned um so for example when i when i st first started out in uh, doing public debates many of the, the shuyuk which were instructed me those i knew um they would say for example that uh, jihad is uh, purely defensive it's a purely defensive endeavor so you know, these are people who I made the mistake of. I said trusting because of authority, and I didn't. Um, I didn't look too much into uh, classical scholarship uh, from direct source texts, which I advise everyone should do actually, uh, because people think that you know this different mashir of today. They're somehow masum, like oh, because you have some knowledge, you are now sinless, and you are, are, will not be bent by biases. Uh, but many are uh, because they are a product of their time, unfortunately, when. We, we should be uh, we should transcend time and history and by and you can only do so by following that by revelation revelation is maybe, something that transcends it maybe they're overly compassionate <laughs> well I, I don't know about that but um uh, well what, what I'll say is uh, so um so they they made arguments to me like oh the, the, the war of the Persians the war of the Romans these were all just uh, preemptive um, you know walls of defense and so on and so forth um but when so so initially I might have argued like this but but then I couldn't. Uh, even back then, I saw problems with the with, with what they were saying and with uh, the narratives that I was beginning to read from classical texts um, directly. Um, and so I then understood through a gradual process uh, that, uh, well, it, you know, it, if if you want peace on earth, everyone wants peace on earth, but no one's prepared to to actually do what it takes to uh, to achieve it within reason, of course. And the is Islam had has a brilliant method. Uh, to grant the the prayers of everyone around the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, who pray for peace, which is I call I, I call it the Pax Islamica, from the mm -hmm. the Latin word Pax meaning peace, you know, like the Pax Romanum, right? The peace of Rome, um, because if you truly want peace around the world, uh, then you need to be to take on the position of policeman, right? You need to then uh, be the guardians uh, of of those of everyone um, it, and. Anyone that aspires to create peace in the world does that. Everyone does that. Right? America does that by making military bases everywhere and putting everyone under their, sw their sphere of influence. Right? This is the Pax Americana. Right? But Islam has its own perspective on that. Uh, but unlike the Pax Americana or the, the European colonialism, Islam doesn't oblige Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians, Zoroastrians um, uh, some might say uh, uh, mushrikeen who are non-Arab uh, non mushrikeen, depending on which madhab you follow, that is, uh, to follow the, the sharia of, of, of Islam uh, in their own internal community dealings, right? So we don't force them to change. To, we don't prohibit them from drinking alcohol, eating pork. Uh, historically speaking, that's not how the caliphate has ever has dealt with, uh, with them by banning them from doing things that we disagree with. There is ikhtilaf in a few areas, of course, um, but... You know, we don't colonize people by for cha forcefully changing their culture, but Islam is meant to guarantee the peace so that m everyone is is not oppressed. So I began to to see this within the Islamic um, uh, understandings of, of classical jurisprudence, uh, which was very different to what some modern um, scholars, imams say, because they've been affected by the, the current context that they live in, unfortunately. Not everyone, not all of them, but many. Uh, and some of my teachers as well were affected by this. And so I, I learned by reading, starting to trust the classical scholars 
um, and just taking my ideas only from classical scholarship. And um, of course, there are many scholars today who reaffirm exactly what classical scholars have said, and they are they are proud and open and brave um, in, in doing so. Uh, but these people are never going to get appointed to official positions in different countries by the government in these countries in the Muslim world, or uh, because, of course, um, the whole point of uh, of colonialism was to change the the dynamics such that pe Muslims who advocate for a holistic Islam will never be granted a official position or recognition um, in, uh, in in Muslim countries. Uh, you know, and, and the only way to survive is to at least, if, if you are not going to compromise, if you're not going to uh, to change the deen of Islam or misrepresent it, is to just be quiet about those aspects of Islam that um, the state would, dis would dislike or the secularists would dislike or the colonists would dislike. Um, so, you know, that's that's what's happened, unfortunately, in the Muslim world um, that, that I've seen. But the classical scholars, I mean, like, alhamdulillah, we have, you know, the preservation of the Arabic texts. Um, uh, many of them put online free to access um, or you can buy them um, of the classical texts, which alhamdulillah is great because we have access to classical scholars who are who, who are who are. You know, in their times, there's no secularism, there's no liberalism, there's no colonialism. So they are they're going to present their opinions as is. So I, I learned um, from classical scholars. I adjusted many of my um, ideas. Thankfully, though, uh, because I was very cautious, I don't think there's many things I've ever said in the past that uh, I need to take down or publicly retract because I was very um, uh, uh, I was very frugal with what i what claims i made i would never make a claim unless i've, I've completely bottom out the research on the matter um but you know i may have said initially that some wars that happened were defensive in nature um and, and you could argue maybe uh, strategically they were uh, but you could also argue that in a way um all wars of, of an islamic caliphate with which with its it's moving the borders ever outward uh, to uh, rescue non-muslims who are living under oppression uh, living under um those who are not guarding them uh, uh, by the deen of Islam, um, that it's always defensive because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, uh, to paraphrase, um, you know, if you give up um, jihad, if you if you forsake it, then there'll be there'll come a time where the, the these these non-Muslims will come and they will attack you and they will invade you. So in essence, either you either you are you know projecting your the sphere of influence of the, of the deen of Islam, the deen of Haq, the deen of justice. Or they're going to project their sphere of influence onto you. There's no middle ground uh, between those two things. So you could even argue it's 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 defensive in that philosophical kind of way. Um, but those are things I, I you know I, I changed um, over time. Also the issue of irtidad. If there's still if there's time, I can if if if, if you give me a time to relate to my experience on that. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, you know, see the initial that was seen in England uh, was again was initially apologetic uh, and i don't mean in the greek term apologia meaning defensive but although you could say that but it was very much like don't mention aspects of islam that contradict liberalism uh, but just merely show liberals that islam is um you know that they that they should tolerate it because it's not that different from them which is the wrong absolutely the wrong strategy to do so because you end up telling muslims that islam is liberal and that they become liberal oh because they think that's that's all. It's totally fine. That was a very bad. But I, I kind of, I begun my public speaking uh, in in such a milieu. That was the the way. That was the mindset of uh, many uh, speakers um, uh, at, at that time, or or how they many imams and many other people in England. That is, you know, uh, they, they weren't supporting LGBT. They, it wasn't that. They just didn't want to cause fitna by showing there was a clash between Islam and liberals. Not that they were liberal per se. These were conservatives. They just didn't, didn't want to show a clash because that causes fit, that they said. So um, into that milieu, there was, well, how do you explain irtidad, uh, which is translated as apostasy, right? Um, so I was hearing from teachers. I was hearing from people that are saying, oh, it's, it is, um, it's for those who are harbi, right? Those who are fighting, those who are, uh, uh, who, uh, they renege Islam, but they, they fight Muslims and they attack the Muslim community and so on and so forth. And of course, I mean, if you look at classical scholarship, you know, Sapanla, you know, this is something that has an ijma across all Sunni schools, the Shia schools, the Ibadi school, everyone. Uh, there is not a single classical scholar that has any difference of opinion on the matter, which is if anyone publicly reneges, as in, i.e., makes makes known to anyone else in that in Muslim society uh, uh, to some degree, um, 
that they have reneged their Islam, uh, then this is a capital offense, right? So this is a capital offense. There's no, there's no ambiguity in uh, what the classical scholars have said. So uh, you hear people trying to go around and say, "Oh, it just means this, or it means that," or, or Abu Hanifa, uh, he said that you know women are not to, uh, are not to to be capital punishment is not for women, murtadin. Uh, so that mean that shows that it's only men because men are fighters. Um, I saw these discussions and so on and so forth. But ultimately speaking, as you know, there's uh, you have to admit what is the hooker, right? There's been no difference of opinion about it for centuries and centuries and centuries. I know there's a, there's a hadith which says that you could exile um, the murtad um, is a, is a, in a sahih hadith that you can you can exile them. But the classical scholars never seem to uh, use that and they might have reasons why so how to argue this right how to argue this point without compromising the deen of islam so usually when i go on non-muslim platforms uh they give you a very little time to explain it and i so i, I do i use this strategy of um i try to to hook them to make them expend more time insisting it so that then, then it gives me more time to explain it so i'll say oh it's for only sedition and treason Right, but bear with me here, right? Why am I saying this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're like, they then that forces them to, to say, uh, oh, but it's not because of uh because uh you know it doesn't require them to be fighting or them to be publicly agitating for rebellion or so on. So I, I wait for them to then then I say, Oh, well, I'm glad you said that because let me explain then why it is sedition and treason and why do I say that? And for those for people who might say, Oh, but Abdullah. Are you uh, not being unclear when you give that initial, uh, you know, kind of explanation, uh, which could cause confusion? I said, well, it's a hook for further questioning because um, there was once the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said mm -hmm. there are no old women in Jannah, right? It, it, and he, like he just left it there, right? And then the Sahaba was like, but what? That's not fair, you know, like because because well, but are you sure? Because well, but old women, you know, like what, what they're righteous and so on. And then he explained that because everyone will be young. In Jannah, they won't be mm -hmm. old, right? Or he, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, "Help your brother, whether he's the oppressed or the oppressor," and then he like left it there, right? and then was like, so "Then wait for the Sahaba to say, okay, well, look, we understand to help him, whether he's when he's the oppressed, but why the oppressor?" And then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, explained, "Not you're not helping him in his oppression, but you're helping him by preventing him to oppress." So I I was um, inspired by the, the tactic of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and so I did. I I did that, and and then when when I get to explain, I'll say, okay, now here's my explanation. Yeah, so we know there's an Azbab and Azul. We know there's a Hadith where there was uh, two individuals who of, of, of um, from a Jewish background. And they said, let's become Muslim by day, and then by evening we leave it, and we come to cause dissension amongst the Muslims, right? To to cause them, you know, to cause doubts and so on, so on. to say to say there's nothing in this, right? There's nothing in the Deen of Islam. So they they were intending to uh, cause disruption. Uh, by leaving Islam Now that's point number one That's an evidence number one Before I, I go to my explanation Evidence number two I want to bring Is Umar uh, Radi Anhum Produced an ijtihad Which is he, he said uh, Let's wait three days and two nights And during those three days and two nights We explain to the person Who has reneged their Islam uh, you know what's wrong with the, what, what, what is their problems What's their doubts Maybe we can explain it And if they come back No problem Right mm -hmm. No problem so that's point number two. So then what's going on here, right? So what's happening here? So here's, uh, then I, I, I kind of then learned the hikmah of it, uh, that Islam has. And alhamdulillah, you know, as Muslims, um, I, I view myself as, uh, as a, a translator. I'm trying to translate to the Western mindset, the wisdoms of Islam. So I say, why is tradition and treason? Well, let's hear me out on this matter. So, uh, Civilization is based ultimately on the fulfillment of contracts. Okay, if tomorrow the government says that all contracts are only optional, right? Mm -hmm. Then the entire society will collapse. Everyone then, because then, uh, and following the law is optional because it, 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 it no longer has authority. It no longer has authority. Then uh, society will collapse, right? You could say, "Oh, but we can all be righteous." Well, yeah. Let's wait how long that that until those who start to break the, those contracts and those who start to break the laws uh, will will come because you've now given permission to you've shown that it's empty, right? These things with civilization is based on is empty. So, 
Um, in a nation state, the, the, the binding of the society is based on nationalism. And in England, for example, if you, if you renege, if you do irtidad of your nationality, which you can do online, you can just say, I renege my English citizenship, uh, you know, like a bye bye, they will send you out of the country, right? You'll be kicked out mm -hmm. of the country. And if you say, no, 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 I want to stay, the police are going to use violence, right? They're going to forcefully arrest you. And, and, you know, and if you happen to have a weapon and you start waving it around and say, look, don't come near me, I, I renege my citizenship, but I will not leave this land, uh, then they, they're going to use a weapon. They might shoot you, they might kill you. Right? If, you if you say, I'm not going to kill anyone, uh, but I'm going to defend myself, they, will, they might kill you. So this is, this is what can happen when you renege your, um, the basis behind the civilization that you're in. In Islam, it's not nationality, it's the basis of civilization, it is the deen of Islam, it is the Quran and Sunnah, and your belief in the haq of the Quran and the Sunnah, and the, its revelation comes from the creator of the universe. And so the Islamic civilization is upheld by the strength that this these things are true, and therefore are the basis of all authority and even morality itself. Mm -hmm. And if you can simply renege that and say, I, I throw off my binding on this. You then show it's meaningless. You show it, it is empty. And that is sedition and treason, right? By characterization. The very fact you've done that is, is sedition and treason. Now, we know that people who left the Islamic lands and they apostated and they left, no one ran after, ran after them. No one said, let's chase them down and find out this, these people and like, uh, uh, you know, uh, kill them or what have you. There were people who left and became Christian. Uh, while you know they were they spoke to some christians in medina and they let and then they left and they became christian outside medina no one chased them down uh to to say oh we have to kill you now what have you they left and they announced their apostasy or they they reneged outside of the the, the lands of islam and of course uh, in surah nisa ayah 89 to 91 it talks about those who revealed their kufr but they leave you they separate from you and they go to seek refuge but with the uh, people between whom you have um, a peace treaty with, uh, so Allah does not give you way against them, and their hearts are restrained from fighting you. Right, so th this shows that if they, you know, they leave us, and they they can do whatever they want outside the lands of Islam. Right, we're not going to chase them down. We don't care. You know, like, goodbye. Don't let the door hit you on the backside on the way out. Type <laughs> type thing. Um, so this is um, so this is the hikmah of Islam that you're you're not compelled to stay in the Islamic lands. There's no iron curtain, uh, but if you're going to stay. And you have uh, uh, taken on the mantle of Islam upon you. Uh, uh, you can't renege it uh, and publicly announce that reneging. Now, if you if you renege it but keep it to yourself and you don't tell anybody, well, we really have a name for those kind of people. They're called munafiqeen, right? And the Prophet Muhammad sallam, knew who who were the munafiqeen and he didn't kill them, even though he was given revelation. But because they they kept it nice and private, um, you know, to themselves. So. This is the, the hikmah of Islam is that you can't allow uh, a civilization based on revelation uh, to be undermined and therefore people's rights and, and justice and the laws of the state and the laws of contracts and the laws of morality itself uh, be undermined by people simply uh, uh, treating everything as voluntary. You can't have civilization um, undermined by people that treating civilization itself, true civilization, as a voluntary prospect, right? And yet remaining amongst you. So this is where I started to, um, uh, you know, uh, I started to differ with, uh, with uh, let's say, many other people in how they discuss Islam because they might avoid this topic altogether. Um, and I also um, differed from other people because I, I don't like to use the word apostasy, which is a, a, a Western word. Um, the, the true translation of irtidad is what, right? It is to renege, right? So a murtad is literal translation is a renegade. Right? They've become uh, by the literal Arabic translation, and so those are the kind of things that I adopt. Uh, I, well, I, I adopted because as a dai, my um, remit is speaking English to pe English speakers in the West, and to make Westerners understand Islamic concepts by the best approximation I can to things that they know or, or things that they can conceive of. But as a dai, uh, or, or or anyone who's a scholar or an imam, no one has the right to amend or edit the deen of Islam itself. You have to present it as is. But you do have the, um, you can use hikmah in how you characterize it called, without misrepresenting, but how you characterize it if it does aid translation of the concept better. And the, the non-Muslim can see the hikmah. And I've had many non-Muslims say that um, 
you know, I, I, you know, I, I find it hard to get around that, but I, you know what? It, it makes sense what you say. It makes sense what, what you have. You explained it. It makes sense. It has an internal logic and I can respect that. So Alhamdulillah, you know, and that, that's, that's, um, those are the things I've developed over, over many years is uh, better ways to translate Islamic concepts. Okay. Mashallah. Um, yeah. So I have to go pray soon. So I just had uh, one other question for you um, because you travel between the UK and the Canada often, and you have a unique perspective perhaps on this question, but it's all often said that the UK Muslim community is somehow behind uh, the U S or Canada in terms of liberalization. Um, oh, in the U S we're five or 10 years ahead of everyone else in terms of basically becoming deviant, uh, in our acceptance of liberalism and feminism, etc. So, I guess this is a compliment. Some people mean it as a compliment for the UK. Other like liberals consider that to be like a knock against the UK. Like, oh, they're so backwards. They haven't accepted the the light. Uh, but do you think this is true? Like, how do, how would you compare North American Muslim community with the UK? Um, what kind of insights have you gleaned over the years? Uh, I was going to ask you, um, how long have you got until you have to pray? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> Um, like, do, do we have five minutes at least, or uh, when? Yeah, yeah, inshallah, cause... we have a few minutes. So, all right, it's um, uh, okay. Well, the the Rand Corporation is um, as as you know, it's a, a military think tank. Uh, I think one of the second largest in the world, or um, very very large, or sorry, the second most prominent think tank in the world after the Brookings Institute. I think according to one survey, I forgot what it was or what one list. Um, so they advise the American military, the American Department of Defense. Um, and they produced this document, uh, 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 Civil Democratic, Democratic Islam, which you know, but there's, there's not a document called Building uh, Moderate Muslim Networks, which you probably also know as well. Um, so they themselves asked this question, like, why is there a disparity between um, uh, British Muslims on the whole and American Muslims on the whole? And they uh, produced an explanation, which I think more or less tracks, which is... Uh, after World War II, there's immigration to the West to rebuild it. Uh, uh, those that went to America, uh, or the United States, United States of America, um, to be more exact, uh, maybe Canada as well, uh, were Muslims who came from middle-class backgrounds in the Muslim world. Uh, those who went to England um, were from usually working-class backgrounds in the Muslim world, or like, you know, like farmers and all the such. Uh, they usually weren't from wealthy backgrounds. Not everyone, but generally speaking. So uh, you had, um, you know, Muslims that come to the, to the West and they're really from middle class backgrounds. And this is off the colonialism. So those who are the middle class are closer to to kind of, you know, the colonial ideas and things like that in, the, in their own countries. But also something else, uh, which is uh, those who enjoy luxuries. Uh, and I think in America, uh, most Muslims who are in the middle class um, because they, they, they were middle class and they came, they were professionals. They maybe were doctors and engineers and so on and so forth. Uh, so they started working in, in high level jobs and made a lot of money. And you know, in the United of America, it's, it's quite big. And there's, so there's, there's enough space in America for everyone to do their own thing, quote unquote, and uh, not interfere with each other's lives. And so they saw uh, that America seemed to be uh, a meritocratic uh, society, more or less, although there's issues of racism and so on and so forth. But uh, they had nice houses, at least two minimum two cars, uh, you know, massive pantries of food and uh, a lot of comfort there. Uh, whereas in England, uh, Muslims are most likely to be, um, you know, uh, uh, poor in, in, in the poor segments of society, uh, you know, uh, certainly in, in more working class area, uh, uh, segments of society, um, not in the well to do areas. Basically, in England, you know, Muslims aren't enjoying the high life, you could say, of Western civilization. So if you're a Muslim and you go to, uh, you know, America, uh, you know, as Iran calls it, the great Satan. And But the great Satan gives you this really nice, comfortable house and, you know, nice car and and lots of money in your account, bank account. And they don't care if you build mosques, more or less. Um, and you just go to the mosque and you come back and, you know, uh, you know, there's um, no one's really bothering you per se uh, because there's so many, it's a melting pot of different cultures and, and religions. So no one really cares about those things as much. Uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, at least according to the official story, uh, then you're going to feel very comfortable. It's pretty hard to hate uh, uh, the ideology behind the a, a country that you are very comfortable in. Okay, it's pretty hard to hate it or to see the problem with it. 
when you're oh it's nice and comfortable okay and of course ultimately then many uh, you know imams and scholars and so on and so forth who are, who are being raised in that society uh, when they they can open up institutes and you know academies and the state in America it, there's a lot more protections against people's personal freedoms in America uh, so uh, they think oh well we can thrive here we can teach whatever we want uh, of course they then see there are uh, there's social compulsion and there's social restrictions that are that are, are exist in America um, and obviously then they can't handle that but at least they succumb to the American quote unquote dream right. Uh, because there's there's enough space and land in America. America's very big. And there's you know it's rich and so on and so forth. In England, we're all cr we're all crammed up next to each other on a small <laughs> island, uh, you know. And the government is very interfering in uh, and interferes regularly with Muslim charities with Matt Masajid. Um, the the conservatives here are different kind of conservatives to your conservatives over there uh, amongst non-Muslims. The conservatives here support gay marriage. They support LGBTQ. Um, they might have issues with transgender. That hasn't they haven't accepted that just yet. Um, but they'll be actively talk, they'll be actively using LGBT ideologies and promoting it um, as a means to assimilate Muslims here because they view Muslims as a fifth column, Islam as a a a, um, a dangerous element that needs to be assimilated and transformed to be comply compliant with uh, uh, British nationalism or what have you. So Muslims here from day one felt the pressure of racism, felt state interference. Uh, felt um, that they were never accepted and that they were always constantly being interfered with. And so we developed, we were not so deluded uh, with the uh, illusion of uh, tolerance uh, that Western society claims it believes in. And of course, in France, even more so, because the French government doesn't even pretend to be um, to be tolerant, really. It, it will just say, well, let's, let's, back, let's close down mosques and let's uh, force women to wear what we want them to wear and a whole bunch of things. Or, or not wear what we, what we don't want them to wear. So uh, we're not under the illusion of, of comfortable Western civilization in, in Europe. That I would agree with the RAND Corporation, um, you know, uh, on that. Here's a little sound bite. Abdullah agrees with the RAND Corporation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could take that out of context. There you clip go. It, clip it there. Clip it there, yeah. So um, I think that they that does explain, to some extent, uh, some of the sociological factors that are, are in play, that Muslims never... We're under the illusion that we're nice and that uh, the Western civilization was it was uh, was tolerant. Uh, even um, you know uh, uh, scholars which are not usually known for rocking the boat, uh, you could say, uh, like uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, uh, Doctor Doctor Tim Winter. Mm -hmm. um, even he was saying years, decade ago, that you know liberalism doesn't tolerate Islam, and he was very open about this these these uh, topics. That you know, even though he's a you might say a quiet English academic, but he's even you know. Someone like him, who you'd think, well, academics would be the most quietest, um, but he's open about he's very about these things, and this is really reflects a mentality. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have liberals uh, who also claim to be Muslims at the same time. Uh, we have Maj mm -hmm. uh from the Quilliam in, um, Foundation, which is widely hated by Muslims in the UK um, for helping the British government persecute Muslims. That we would say producing blacklists of Muslim organisations giving that to the the, the, the government uh, to uh, be intolerant of Muslims and subject us to scrutiny and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, and, and we do have Muslims who are also, again, you know, uh, who argue to be compliant with the status quo or to uh, play by, uh, to accept the rules of the status quo and um, to say, or get involved in democratic elections to elect legislators because it, it gives us, um, it gives us a benefit um, and I say, well, you might give Muslims the benefit of having uh, leverage because as Muslims, well, as as a group of people, but not as Muslims and representing Islam, right? We are compromising Islam to get some uh, some benefit. So we have those people. We we do. We have um, uh, you know people that like uh, uh, Hamza Youssef, not to be confused with the American Hamza Youssef, uh, uh, the, uh, the the premier of, of Scottish Palm in, in, in Scotland. Who kind of who said uh, under interview he didn't want to appear to be you know anti LGBT so he said what he said I think that's well known what he said um, mm -hmm. uh, so we we have those things we have Sadiq Khan in London uh, who I think uh, appear uh, took a picture it was photographed in a Hindu temple you know uh, arguably doing obeisance to a, a Hindu idol um, uh, which is uh, well to put it mildly uh, not very good putting it very mildly there um 
so we, we have those people here. Yes, of course, yeah, obviously. Um, but America seems to be a, a different ball, a different kettle of fish. But there are Muslim holdouts in America and Canada too. There are Muslim holdouts. Maybe after the Salah, I'll tell you about um, an experience I encountered in, in um, the University of British Columbia based in Vancouver in Canada, which had a, a left-wing, a, Mus a, a, a Muslim identifying uh, left-wing movement which was trying to take over the Muslim Student Association there. Um, they were, I, I believe, they were advocating that, you know, Komalut, uh, their only crime was that they were raping people without consent. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's halal to have consensual sex with the same same sex and so on and so forth. Uh, they were arguing about um, uh, neo-Marxist ideologies, critical race theory. Um, they were arguing Mar outright Marxism. Quite literally, they say Marxism is the way forward for um, for, for uh, human society and that Islam is compatible with Marxism. I never thought I'd hear the day I'd see that before. I thought that died with the Cold War, but it's come back now. Um, all kinds of things. Um, they were arguing that, you know, obviously heteronormativity doesn't deserve that. They were uh, promoting books that argued that heteronormativity does not deserve the privilege of being the norm, uh, sexuality and things like this, all kinds of things like that. Um, uh, so... I, I was asked by a very desperate and beleaguered MSA to come help them uh, deal with these people. And I uh, did an investigation there, um, which lasted, uh, well, it was sometimes in my part time, but I did a, it lasted seven months where I, I investigated all communications that happened. Uh, these left wingers were accusing the MSA, because the MSA were resisting them, the left wingers were accusing the MSA of being racist and sexist. And and Muslims were scared that the conservative Muslims were scared that oh we don't want to associate with this MSA oh well you know or or they might say quietly you know on the on on phone calls I support you brother and then put the phone but I you know I, I just can't say anything in public and then then just you know that was it you know uh, so they were left by themselves everyone deserted them and then, then I did this uh, investigation and I published it online and I showed the truth of the matter looking at all internal communications of the MSA looking at the communications and beliefs touted by these. Uh, left wingers and exposed them and they were exposed um you know uh, completely and you know people and and strangely enough they were still conservative muslims some of them who were friends of these people saying oh why did you have to you know, publish a report about it it was it, you know it, it hurt them it's like uh, in what way i i the report simply quoted them i i didn't even characterize them anyway i didn't even say anything about that i simply said here's what they say are they ashamed of their own uh, own words they're not ashamed they're just embarrassed that it got exposed right mm -hmm. but they're not ashamed of these words because they believe these these ideas they i just quoted them what did i say was actually wrong and they of course they couldn't find anything but they were uh, and, and uh, you get re responses from some conservative muslims there some of them said to me one of them said to me i said you know look I, you know they'll say why did you do this the report it was very you know it was a bit harsh and say well they're, they're promoting lgbt and i say but it was harsh and say what well, is this kufr right promoting lgbt saying it is halal to have um same-sex relationships um uh, which are consensual what have you this is this is it's kufr to say that this is halal is permissible and he said well uh, he said well I, I don't know about that i, I don't believe it but I, I don't know about that but like you know it's a bit harsh i say wait a second wait a second you are in doubt about the kufr of the one who clay who says that same sex relationships being halal you you're, you're in doubt of the kufr of that statement then the, and they said well i just don't want to get do took fear i don't wanna, like subhanallah this was the kind of things i encountered there um you know the 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 conservative muslims were scared to say anything to advocate for their deen uh or to, or to do takfir I mean, look takfir is bad in many cases yes but it exists for a reason. There is you, there are cases where you must do takfir, uh, because you're not removing someone out of the fold of Islam. You're simply describing where they already are, right? Right. Mm -hmm. They're already outside the fold. You're just saying, oh, by the way, you just happen to be there. Oh, how dare you say? Um, if someone jumps off the ship, and you say, uh, excuse me, mate, you're like you know you you're outside the ship. Oh, how dare you throw me out of the ship? No, you threw yourself out. I'm just pointing out to you that you're outside of the ship and you're, you know, you're being, you're in the waves and so on and so forth. You know, so this is the um, the, the situation. So I, I learned from that um, that left wing movements amongst Muslims uh, are quite strong in many places in Canada, and Muslims don't put up much resistance to it, and be most because they don't, they haven't been, 
inoculated into the into the cover of um, or what left wing ideology is um, called to. They don't even recognize the the, the problem. They think it's just uh, something minor, um, and they don't they don't see the issue. So they're more vulnerable and susceptible to left wing move uh, ideology spreading amongst them. Um, and the, the local Shuyuk actually thanked me for doing some some uh, some um, courses there. And I'm going to be releasing um, a five day lecture series that I did at UBC on the invitation of of the UBC MSA uh, to uh, on uh, going through all Western uh, ideologies and showing in detail each one. It, it goes against the Quran and Sunnah. Um, you know, I, I don't. You know, it's funny that I have to do this, but. You know, it's not funny. It's it's tragic that I, you know, I have to do this, but this is what's needed because they, many of the Canadian Muslims say, "What's the problem with with Marxism? What's the problem with uh, critical race theory? What's the problem with um, feminism? Um, you know, like what's the issue with it?" I said, "Why do I have to explain this to you? Isn't it not obvious for yourself?" And the report I did um, juxtaposed these ideas with Quran and Sunnah to show them, look, it incontrovertibly contradicts, inevitably contradicts the Quran and Sunnah, even if I have to state the obvious, Marxism doesn't just contradict the Quran and Sunnah because it's atheistic. It contradicts it because it denies the right of private ownership. Islam allows the right of private ownership. For many ahadith uh, and, and Quranic verses, um, also it allows the existence of rich people, right? Something that couldn't exist in Marxism and and, and many such such points. Um, Islam allows you to, to, to have people who uh, you pay them wages for work. Right, but uh, you know, a Marxist would say that this is exploiting the, their their um, the surplus value of the worker, of, of you know, uh, which is a, a crime for Marxists. So mm. this is the kind of things that I did in in UBC and what I saw. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work, but um, there are. I, I would be lying to, if I said there wasn't left wing Muslim, so left wingers who identify as Muslim in the UK too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, appreciate the answer. Um, so we have some super chats that uh, are directed uh, just generally. And then one of them is actually for you. Um, super chat from Brother Ahmed. Jazakallah khair. He says, Brother Daniel, I've learned a lot from you. I'm Ethiopian living in Canada now. You've opened my eyes to a lot of things. Keep up the good work. Jazakallah khair. Appreciate that, brother. Um, so this is for you uh, from uh, Brother Talha. Talha says, how would you, uh, Abdullah, go about debating a modernist and a deceptive academic? Um, what is your approach? Uh, such a debate is intriguing as most lay Muslims are traditionalists naturally. However, educated modernists are targeting the youth. So how do you approach debating like an educated modernist who is also deceptive? Should I answer that? Because I'll, I'll be giving away Daniel's strategy strategy on Friday, I think. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Against um, uh, I've debated I debated modernists. Um, you know, interesting enough, I actually got into public speaking because of modernists uh, who were misrepresenting Islam so badly. Um, I just couldn't remain silent because no one was no one was refuting them. No one was answering mm -hmm. them. Um, yeah, you had a debate with um, Akyol, I think Mustafa Akyol. Yeah, Mustafa Akyol. Um, should Islam be uh, reformed or something? This. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the uh, at um, it was London School of Economics. Sorry, it was uh, the London the School of Oriental and African Studies, which is part of the University of mm. um, London. Um, that place is a hotbed of left wing idea ideologies yeah. for non Muslims. Like you know, it's 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 a uh, ground zero um, for uh, left wing ideologues and things like this. So yeah, I debated him on that on that topic, um, and. Uh, I've debated many other modernists. You can see in my uh, in, in the past. Um, I must confess uh, that of all the people I respect the least, it is them. Um, uh, you know, an athe you bring me atheist, bring me a uh, the, the most mushrik of mushrik Hindus, and I will con I will uh, respect them more um, as th than a, a modernist. And there's a reason for that, which is um, I. I embraced Islam at 14 and I used to be non-Muslim and I spent many years desperately searching for revelation and for the truth uh, because there's different religions I didn't know which one was right I, I was worried I'd, I'd be re believing the wrong one and I went on a, on a journey of to, to look and uh, to, to find the truth and you know I saw how society there was something in me that told me that society was living in a, a, 
an inhuman in an inhuman way. We, humans weren't meant to live in the kind of modern society we're seeing, not just in cities, but more uh, the, the the social structure, the the values, the ideas, the the practices. Um, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I, I was a product of of liberal society. I was born and raised there, you know. But something just told me something's wrong with the picture. And so I was so appreciative of revelation. Um, there was a point when I was looking where I thought that maybe no one had discovered the purpose of life because I was always told by the media, by movies and films, that no one knows the purpose of life. There is no, you know, it's 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 an impossible question. No one can know it. And I was like, no, I want to, I want to learn this. I want to study. I want to to find out that answer. And then imagine my surprise to discover that not only is the purpose of life already known, but it's known by uh, you know 1.2 or 1.4 at the time billion people on planet Earth. And yet many of them uh, weren't implementing it, or rather uh, weren't implementing it holistically. It was not being implemented holistically anywhere, actually. That was a big shock to many uh, converts or reverts to Islam. But modernists, they are, they are people who were born into a Muslim background. They had access to revelation as a child. I would have loved to have um, been inculcated uh, with uh, with Salah and with fasting and uh, and uh, uh, kind of just all the, the having an Islamic family environment, I would have done anything for that um, growing up. Because you know, because as a convert, a revert, you it, it you take some time to adjust to the requirements of Islam. You know, whereas if you're born as a Muslim, it was easy. I, I would you know, but these people they had access to this revelation in front of them, and they turn away from it when it's given to them on a silver plate. And they prefer they have this great platter of food and you know with silver bowls and silver plates and and cutlery and you know all this this fecundity of of fresh fruits and things and they turn away and they jump into into the mud and they start eating muck from the ground and they love it right rolling around in it right um, that is uh, why I, I I don't really respect them because I don't see. You know why they they how could they have turned around against Islam and they want to change it and what's worse is um, they're different from ex-Muslims. Well, one could argue they are ex-Muslims, but uh, they're different from the let's say the open ex-Muslim. The open ex-Muslim says, uh, you know, I'm, maybe I'm colonized, whatever the case might be, but I am going to leave Islam and I'm going to publicly tell everybody this and I'm going to live my life moving on, doing my own thing, whatever uh, meaning I want to invent and make up. In the in my, as my own fantasy, I can respect that more than the someone than someone who says, "No, I'm not going to publicly leave Islam. I'm going to change Islam into a fantasy, right? Uh, into some uh, whimsical, vain fantasy that I've been conditioned by my historical conditions to believe in. I'm going to do that. That's mm -hmm. why I really don't respect um, modernists at all. Uh, and and so when I debate them. I, I act a bit more different than I would uh, when I debate anybody else. Um, I, I just, uh, I mean, I won't insult them to their face and what have you, of course, um, that we always must must uh, show decorum. Of course, uh, Islamic adab is, is, is obligatory upon us at all times, but um, I just don't, I just don't view them with um, as much respect as I would view debating someone from a Christian background who's a Christian, an atheist background who's an atheist and so on and so forth. Uh, because they have revelation, they turned their back on it, and they but they stayed, they 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 still stayed with the label of Islam. So they want to actively now corrupt it. I mean, why doesn't it not occur to them that look, if if you think Islam is so uh, it, it is is so bad, uh, why does it need you coming fourteen hundred years later to to say, oh no, here's what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam really meant? It's like really. So was the Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a bad communicator Sorry, Was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a bad communicator That he couldn't make clear the liberal worldview I mean John Locke's writings on liberalism It's pretty clear cut about liberalism It's very easy to understand uh, if, you, if the intention is liberalism right? right? But the Quran If you're going to interpret the Quran as being liberal I mean like flog the font, the Zani And the Zania Flog them a hundred you know, for, uh, well, Flog them um, for, for consensual sex That how can you justify that? I, I point that to Mustafa Akio. He had no response to those things, uh, but uh, against them. Um, but because you asked me for a better, a more specific question, which was, what would you argue against them? Here's where you can argue something that they can't defend because they don't bother defending it. You can philosophically, so to speak, 
or, or you could say on first principles, go to attack liberalism itself, the, the, uh, you know, its ability to address human nature. Because the, the modernist is so focused on mental gymnastics of, of Islamic texts, they don't think anyone's ever going to attack the ideology they're calling you to, right? Which is liberalism. And Mus Muslim modernists are a poor knockoff of Western liberals, right? Western liberals, um, you know, they're the teachers. These are the students, right? And the students are, the Mukhaledin are much poorer quality than uh, the, 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 the teachers, or the Western civilization itself, those who, who believe in, in the West, who are academics, or who are liberals, they believe in it based on a philosophical basis, whereas these modernists believe in it because they did, they did a, a tuck lead to it, because, they, because the West was a, a superior civilization in their mind. That's why they mostly follow it. So they, they don't have any intellectual justifications for liberalism. So when I attacked liberalism itself, I said, look, look, look forget Mustafa Akio, forget... Uh, mental gymnastics on the Quran and interpretation Just put that aside for one moment The destination you want to bring us to How does that make sense? Hmm. And that completely wrong footed him Because they don't anticipate You will attack them based on first principles You know, uh, so they, they, what, they think they're going to attack them based on, Well the Quran says it's haram and That's what they're expecting And um, as uh, Sun Tzu says And anyone who wants to go into debates You should read Sun Tzu, Art of War Um uh, you know, uh, attack your opponent from where they don't expect, which sounds kind of obvious. Um, mm. But hey, you know, the Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was, you know, hikmah is hikmah, right? The Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, um, uh, you know, a warfare is based on deception, to paraphrase the, the narration. And Sun Tzu, whose uh, writings were kind of unearthed much later on, so you know, so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi didn't have access to Sun Tzu's writings, said exactly the same thing. It's a it's a hikmah, right? So um, don't let your opponent see you coming. Right? Otherwise, they're going to repair. So I, so uh, maybe I've given the game away, but it won't really help um, your opponent much anyway, Daniel, because uh, they they it will, it will take them much longer to understand why they should be liberal in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you have enough time to prepare <laughs> if you want to go mm -hmm. for that. But that would be my, my suggestion to you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions people will have in the chat? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Any questions for Brother Abdullah? Um, I'd like to say if anyone has any disagrees with anything I've said, uh, either now or before, uh, p please bring it up. I'm always open to criticisms. Um, as I said, I'm my own worst critic, so you'd... Uh, you know, yeah, you uh, mentioned already some of the things that you amended over time when, we, when I asked you about how your dawah has evolved. So... Is there a historical figure you would want to spend a day with? Who would it be? I guess other than the Prophet <laughs> Yeah, that was very obvious. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to be boring and, uh, and say, you know, any one of the Sahabas, um, you know, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, and home. Uh, but that's always easy. Okay, so let, let's say apart from uh, any of the Sahabas, um, who, I, who I want to spend a day with, um, any historical figure, I mean, there's a long list of Islamic uh, things. Um, who would I want to spend a day with? Uh, that's a hard question because I, I want to spend a day with all the four, the four main imams of the Sunni schools of thought. I want to spend a day with each and every one of them. I want to spend a day with Omar Abdul Aziz. Abd -Aziz. I want to spend a day with Imam Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, um, and, and discuss. Have some uh, but, pizza, some pasta. Yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, no, because tomatoes weren't discovered until after the, the new world was discovered, <laughs> so they wasn't present at that time. Um, so we're assuming is, that you can time travel, but you can't and, take tomatoes, but you can't, can't make pizza. Take tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's not be unreasonable, yeah? Let's not be, uh, let's not go into fantasy, yeah? Um, okay, I, I, I would say, uh, I would say, I mean, there's many Muslims. So if I say, okay, after spending time with a whole number of Muslims, uh, Muslim figures mm -hmm. from the past, uh, and I'd be a whole bunch of them, I'd be on a long list. If you were to say, uh, which non-Muslim would I want to spend um, time with? Um, it would probably be um, uh, Socrates and, and when he's in Athens. And why? Socrates, uh, well, I mean, I know Plato kind of uses him as a sock puppet to say, to, to say things on his behalf, as in, 
uh, Plato is one of the main sources of what Socrates said. We don't know how much of it is, so is Plato's actual ideas and Socrates. But Socrates never really argued anything in particular because he said that he didn't he didn't know much. He didn't have he didn't have um, certainty on things. Um, but he spent he spent his time in Athens walking around and trolling the Athenians, his own city. He's saying it, trolling them on every single thing they thought they they knew was right or wrong. Uh, on their customs, on their culture. So why do you say this? It's, oh, you say virtue is good. You know, uh, what is virtue? Oh, virtue is, is the one general would say, oh, uh, well, virtue is just, you know, is, is courage. Okay, so what if there is a, a, a robber uh, who murders and kills people and uh, steals their stuff, but it's very courageous in doing so? Are they virtuous? And so he would just, uh, just turn the arguments around on people all the time to show they had no real basis for what they were believing all the time. And he was accused by the Athenians. Eventually, they the annoyed the Athenians so much, uh, they put him on trial for um, uh, for corrupting the youth and um, uh, atheism, right? like uh, atheism, they called it. Well, not atheism, but for denying the gods of the city. So, you know, uh, Athena and Zeus and so on and so forth. Uh, because interestingly enough, he talks about God in a singular, uh, uh, in a singular, like uh, Theon, or Theos uh, in singular, the the Theos. Uh, we don't know what he's referring to. You know, like, it like well, who's their god you're referring to? Allahu Allah, We don't know what he was. Um, he he's a good guy. He's a he's a good guy to look at to see how to troll. <laughs> I suppose um, uh, how to have a dialectic, right? To to basically unpack people purely by asking questions. He literally just asks questions. Um, and show that people don't have a basis for what they believe in. So that was quite interesting. Uh, yeah. Zenophon is, is, is not a guy as well who... If you, uh, if you want to get executed. <laughs> how, to, uh, how to get executed purely by asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I, I mean, technically speaking, you know, uh, he kind of... He felt that he would compromise if he, w he accepted the... It was actually a, a plea deal. Right, if he accepted that he said what he said was wrong, or that he, he was he uh, showed contrition, uh, or that he even argued that his punishment should be less than the, than death, he didn't care. He, he just like said that he's not going to argue anything. In fact, he actually he gave his speeches uh, in front of the jury, which was actually all, all of Athens, or at least the seniors of Athens, uh, and made them condemn him more. Right, he just didn't care. He wanted to be so principled on the matter. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to compromise at all whatsoever. Uh, and he would just say, "How do I comp how do I corrupt the youth? What did I say that was corrupting?" And it was just, uh, and that made him kill him, basically. So, right. um, yeah. But and it was just funny how he used to. I used when you read about how he used to troll Athens, and he, he would go around the marketplace, strike up random conversations with people, and just uh, boggle their mind by ripping apart everything they thought was certain about things. It was uh, quite funny. Yeah. Okay. Mashallah. Um... Last question. Do you have any debates coming up? Anything exciting that we can look forward to? <laughs> um, I have a debate with, uh, inshallah, uh, Dr. Stephen Law, um, which maybe hopefully uh, you might also encounter uh, at some point in the future. Uh, he's one of the foremost atheist uh, philosophers in England that talks about um, uh, uh, counter theodicy. So, he talk. He argues that God can be argued equally to be evil as much as he can, he can be good. He doesn't believe that God exists. He just wants to say that you know uh, he wants to attack the concept of God by arguing that God is that God can be equally argued to be unjust as much as you might claim to be just or or not merciful or cruel as much as you claim he is merciful. So I plan to have a, a debate with him on the topic of theodicy, the justice of God and the mercy of God. Um, coming up in the next maybe the next couple of months, inshallah. I've got some uh, brand new arguments. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I I like to use debates as a means to publish my arguments by uh, testing them in the crucible of battle, shall we say, against a strong opponent. And so when people can see that the arguments are quite strong because the opponent has no has no response or uh, they fumble over over their words to try to respond, uh, that shows to Muslims watching that the argument is actually quite strong. So I like to publish my arguments um, uh, in debates. Sometimes I'm forced to write blog posts about it because uh, people might, might need to hear the argument as soon as possible and I can't wait for, for a debate. But I like to use my debates to publish brand new arguments, angles, um, 
and so on and so forth. So that's inshallah one of the things which uh, I hope to um, sure. to do in the next couple of months. And where can uh, people, where's the main place that they can go to find you? Twitter? Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, Twitter is a bit of an issue. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, You're having issues on Twitter? Uh, yes, yes. So currently I've been um, shadow banned by Twitter. Um, they've yeah. rated all I... my content to be, there's there's like an age restriction content uh, uh, label on it. So you have to, like, like a wall. Uh, you have to change your settings to see my stuff. Uh, if you Google my, if you Twitter search my name, you won't find my name um on twitter um ever I since thought that was resolved no it is not resolved it's still ongoing um uh twitter has it has decided to they can't they they might not have outright banned my account but they've restricted it so i i've been i used to be gaining like a, a thousand followers a month uh or so uh but then it, it after that moment they shadow banned me it went down to literally jump to their minus or jump down to minus 20 minus 30 per month and slowly slowly uh drip drip decreasing my my followers subscribers and people uh reported they couldn't see me online anymore also some, something maybe happened on facebook too that people said we don't see your statuses anymore i say well i've been publishing my statuses quite regularly um hmm. so they they use shadow banning as a means to restrict people's um yeah uh kind of outreach but if you if you want to see uh some of my work um abdullahalandalusi.com uh, or the Muslim Debate Initiative. You type it into Google, like MuslimDebate.org. Um, you'll, you'll see the, that. Uh, I'm also I also work with two other organizations, um, the Quran Institute, alongside my good friend uh, Mufti Moin Abu Hamza. Um, he's doing some uh, family program, uh, which uh, I think everyone should get involved. It's online uh, and it's comprehensive Islamic. I think it's called the Umatics, um uh, or the uh, diploma um so it's got like an all-round uh holistic teaching of islam uh also i'm a researcher currently I, I research for the i3 institute which are based in canada uh currently but also kind of branching out in the uk uh so so yeah but um yeah so type in muslim debate initiative on you uh, dot org sorry the debate uh muslim debate dot org to get the muslim debate initiative or abdullahalandalusi.com to get my blog or, or just type in Muslim Debate Initiative or Abdul Andalusi on YouTube to find the respective channels. Okay, mashallah. So appreciate you spending the time. I know that everyone from the comments really appreciated uh, your insights. So everyone, please don't forget to like and share the video, add comments, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. So jazakallah khairah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.